Go ahead and call the meeting to order. Would all who wish join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under, under God, God, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Richard. So next up is agenda adjustments. We've had a request from one board member who um, had some stuff happening uh, outside of school board that made it hard for to get to the uh, board self-evaluation to move the board self-evaluation to the next meeting. Uh, on the other hand, we advertise this date publicly. So I just, I told him I would turn it over to the board to see if we wanted to make that change. I don't have any other uh, proposed agenda adjustments. Are there any thoughts of moving the yeah. board? Of my, my apologies for not getting to it. Um, I made the request. Uh, if we could move it, that would be appreciated. If if not, I'll probably, I just haven't haven't been able to do it and or really get through other comments and stuff. So I don't think I can be told, I won't be totally productive, but it's entirely up to you guys, to the group. Um, I'm, I'm certainly fine with with moving it, um, especially if if we won't be able to, to get a whole lot of kind of productive insight from one of the board members that would seem to defeat the purpose of it. Uh, that being said, as Brian pointed out, I think the fact that it's advertised, we may have some people here tonight who um, want to comment on it. Um, at the very least, I know I think it was posted. Was that is the yeah. results posted publicly? The results have not been posted now. Okay. Um, but this date was mentioned in the email that went out to people too, I think. I mean, I guess I can see I can see both ways. I mean, I certainly want all board members to be able to participate fully because um, it is a, a big part of this is for kind of our own, um, you know, kind of assessment of how we're doing and considering how um, members of the public think we're doing. And if one person um, hasn't been able to look at the feedback, um, then that d takes away from the purpose. At the same time, if people are tuning in expecting to hear about it, um, I don't want to kind of waste their time either. So, I mean, I could go either way. I don't know what, what everybody else thinks. It uh, personally doesn't matter to me either way. I I could be wrong, but I don't think we have a lot of looking at the audience here. I'm thinking we don't. Yeah, I'm not gonna be very helpful because I'm, I'm <laughs> either way. I mean, I, I totally like, like Mark C see that some people might have tuned in for that, but I, I, I doubt many people, if we could do it next meeting, probably everybody would be okay with that, I would guess. Or someone can speak up in public comment and say, you guys blew it, but. Yeah. Well, I think I'm hearing four not strong opinions or seeing the balance and one strong opinion to change it. So I think I would go ahead and motion to defer the uh, board self-evaluation till the next meeting in the first week of March. I definitely would not want to defer it later than that because it'll be, uh, you know, it'll be after the election. It should be a reflection of the past year, not the future year. Um, but I, I'm happy to make the motion to move it to the next board meeting. Is there a second? A second. Any further discussion? Thank we'll you. Go ahead. go ahead and vote. Aaron? Aye. Jake? Aye. Mark? Aye. Leo? I mix up the order, huh? <laughs> oh, I did mix it up. <laughs> Just seeing if you're awake. Uh, I also vote aye. Okay, next up we have minutes. I would make a motion to approve the minutes of February 2nd board meeting as presented. Is there a second? I second. Are there any adjustments or Questions. Okay, we'll go ahead and vote. Aaron? Aye. Jake? Aye. Leo? Aye. Mark? Aye. Brian? I also vote aye. Okay, next up we have 
Warrants, this is a long one. I make a motion to approve payroll warrants 16 and 17, regular warrants 16 and 17, bond warrants 30 and 31, and the main purse warrant for January. Is there a second? A second. Any discussion? Okay, Aaron. Aye. Jake. Aye. Leo. Aye. Mark. Aye. I also vote aye. Next up is public comment. Happy to open the floor to public comment. Okay, not seeing any public comment. Um, you can tell we're getting to budgets. <laughs> the uh, meetings are getting smaller. This is one of the smallest meetings we've had in a while. So, uh, but that's disappointing. I'd love to have people uh, attend board meetings. So we're now on to acknowledgements. Do you want to start, Aaron? Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't have anything for this week. I know people have done wonderful things. Um, I just don't have them, but I hope everybody had a great break. Jake. I have nothing. Mark. I have nothing at this time. I don't have anything new, but I just, um, part of my job, I did some outreach to middle school class instruction with some middle schoolers in Warsaw uh, this week. And um, just a reminder that, you know, as some of the students were in the class, I was remote, some of the students were remote. It's just a reminder uh, of what everybody uh, is teaching through right now. Uh, with uh, diverse technologies and approaches and the, the challenges that come with that. So I think all of the board members have said this before and appreciate it and acknowledge that that's happening, but it's very fresh in my mind this week. So I just wanted to, again, acknowledge uh, the very unusual uh, challenges that are occurring this year and the appreciation with which those are being dealt with. Um, Meredith. Brian. Leo. Uh, oh, Leo. I, I, I'm like I'm invisible to you over here. Um, I, I have an acknowledgement of sorts um, that I'd like to make. Um, sadly, uh, I need to take this opportunity to respond to some malicious lies that have been spread about me. Oddly, so, by an Leo, I don't know that that's an acknowledgement. Public comment. I, 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 it's, it's about it's being spread about me, Brian, because I'm sitting in this seat and running for this seat. So I, I do need to, I need to clarify my statement. My, I need to clarify. I need, I need, I need to make the statement if that's all right. I, I get the frustrations of being in public office. I'm just not clear. I guess I'd leave it up to a consensus of the board, whether that's a uh, a use of the time at this point or not. I, I have to confess my instinct is kind of not, but uh, campaigning is somewhat separate from serving, but I don't know what, it, what do other board members think. I, I'm personally fine with it. I guess I worry about the slippery slope too, about who we have to give a right I, to I, I can assure you I'm not saying any names or anything like that, but I, I I've had my character assassinated and uh, a character assassination, and, and I need to clear the record. I, I'm not, I'm, I personally am fine with it so long as there's no, no campaigning going on, um, no. as long as it's just a clarification of, of um, a stance or something that's been said. Um, I'm fine with that, again, so long as there's no campaigning going on. Yeah, I guess I would be most comfortable if you can phrase it, Leo, as a brief clarification of your position on an issue that has occurred in the past. Okay. So uh, the, 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 it's been stated that I don't support the transgender community or vaccines. And I, I want to publicly correct that statement on the record that I absolutely do support the transgender community. And in fact, my voting record from 2016 on this very board backs up this statement uh, with regards to vaccines. I'm not opposed to all the vaccines. I'm opposed to the state having full control over an individual's medical decisions and deciding what and when something gets injected in your body, in my opinion, is not the state's. But, but again, this is being slandered about, about me. I have to add that this really has been the most disgusting political motivated tactic that I've witnessed. In all right, I, I think we're starting to turn into campaigning, but 
That, well, <laughs> it's when it happens to you, Brian, oh, I, I, I guess. I, I get it. I, I'm sure. It, sure. It's a character assassination in, in a small town election. Um, in, a, in, a, in a community like Orono, I, un, unfortunately, I think these are the things that deter people run, from running for local offices. Um, so I, I would only ask that in the world of social media warriors, I, I, I hope people can abide by what we teach our students. If you see something, say something. And, and to be clear, this is not nothing, this is not directed in any way towards my opponent at all. But it's it's been a character assassination and it's been pretty troubling for me. So I, I'm, I apologize if this isn't the right place to get it out there. I do need to get it out there. So thank you. Okay, I think. All right, uh, other acknowledgements, Merida? Yeah, I, I think it just follows on what Brian said. I, I think um, to have a meeting go by and not just acknowledge the RSU staff for their continued tremendous work during uh, this time with so many challenges. This, this is a difficult time of year in school, typically. It's it's um, kind of the, the time of year that um, we see students struggle it's a time of year that's difficult for many people uh, in our in our state. So I just acknowledge our staff for uh, going the distance and, and continuing to do great work. Okay, when next up you have reports, we'll start with director's reports. Uh, Lisa, you wanna go first? I love going behind Meredith Diamond. <laughs> <laughs> So I've been spending a little time looking at the uh, special ed numbers over the last four years in the three buildings and looking at changes. And it is uh, giving me some ideas of, of what my needs will look like next year. Um, ASA looks, it is probably the most stable as far as numbers go. Uh, I do see a, more of a decrease in my OMS numbers and an increase in my OHS numbers. So I'm going to have to look at my staff and, and evaluate where they will, um, you know, be the most effective for our kiddos. So those are things in the planning stages right now. Um, our case manager and social worker from Northern Light have had their vaccinations, both of them. So we're excited. Meredith has okayed them to work in person with our students, which is huge. A lot of our kiddos have have um, and families that have planned to wait and not do teleservices that were being offered. So we're super excited that they're going to be in the buildings and, and meeting our kids face to face during these times where the social emotional supports are, are so needed. Um, as far as summer school goes, the plans are still in the developmental phase. Uh, we're meeting with folks every couple of weeks to try to uh, best meet the needs for special ed, regular ed students, um, any, looking at any gaps we might have because of um, the way school has gone for the last year. Uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll have something pretty creative to offer students and families this summer. Um, I'm in my last round of scheduling staff observations. Uh, and that's been, that's been interesting. I've done some I've participated in some online classes. I've, I've observed uh, through Zoom, I've observed in person. So it's, uh, it just runs the gamut. And it's, you know, unfortunately I haven't been able to really be in classrooms and schools like I would have wished to have been in my first year in the district, but uh, you know, I'll take what I can get. And, and it's exciting to, to see teachers doing what they love to do firsthand. So, and that's all for me. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead with Meredith Diamond. Hi, everybody. Um, Rachel, this is a cue for you. I'm going to go from the bottom of my report to the top because I, I, I know you like it when I start at the beginning and end at the end, so I'm giving you a heads up on that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so three pieces that I wanted to touch on tonight um, with respect to recent work over the past month. Um, the first being uh, updates on assessment. 
So as you can see um, on the assessment um, bullet of my report, we still do not have official word from the state about the um, replacement for Empower Assessment. Um, there is no shortage of folks across the state asking um, when the word is coming down, especially districts who do not currently use um, what some folks are calling the Voldemort assessment, the one that we can't talk about. Um, luckily we do, so we have an advantage there and we have moved forward, um, <clears throat> excuse me, but the spring uh, testing window uh, we have been told is going to open uh, starting March 1st and run through the end of May. Uh, for us, you know, that, that means plenty of time to figure out when we would like to hold our, our spring um, assessment. Uh, we are, you know, have recently wrapped up our, our first round this year, so I anticipate it'll be further toward the end of that window. Um, but we are, are still waiting for word officially. What we do know is that um, the vendor for the science assessment um, is Numeradia, and we don't have a name for that assessment yet. Um, the window has been identified May 17th to May 28th. And uh, the, the state has indicated that this is going to be considered a, a field test administration with um, they're hoping a waiver from public reporting for districts. So give us a chance to familiarize ourselves with the assessment and its administration um, before talking about that data publicly. Um, it will, however, align with next generation science standards. <clears throat> we are in development of a, um, a new data analysis protocol for the district to help us make most um, the most impactful use of our NUIA data as we can. Um, we are going to begin that um, analysis at the, the classroom level, looking specifically at um, specific students and then looking at trends on grade level um, subsequent to the identification of RSU 26 specific quartiles. Um, and then we will, um, through a, a deep dive, hopefully come to um, some conclusions about opportunities for um, investment um, of, of instruction and reflection subsequent to looking at those, those quartiles. So that, that is in process and um, we're gonna begin that work with teachers on, on March 3rd. And then our data workshop for the board will um, build on conclusions reached in those, um, th that data analysis with teachers. So that is our, our assessment update. Um, very, I'm very, very excited to report that we had our first Wabanaki Studies work group meeting on February 11th. Um, and this is a, a group of folks who are, you know, coming together to think through um, how Wabanaki Studies has manifested in the district so far um, and how we may manifest it in a more comprehensive way that is true to uh, LD291 um, and in a way that takes advantage of our you know, location with proximity to such incredible um, resources, human resources, um, institutions like the Abbey Museum, um, you know, there really is a, a wealth of opportunity for us to maximize our, um, the, the, reach of comp, uh, the reach of Wabanaki Studies in the district. Uh, we held, we have our second meeting scheduled for March 11th, um, and at that meeting we're going to zero in on our goals for the year and um, hear back from some teachers who are beginning outreach to students to get some uh, their perspectives on uh, their experiences in RSU 26 as Wamanaki students. And lastly, I wanted to touch on a, a pivot that the, the Tech Committee is making. So the Tech Committee, as you know, has been meeting all year. Initially it was weekly. We moved to bi-weekly meetings and our work has been to this point driven largely by the needs um, created by the COVID learning circumstance. Um, but we have an eye to the fact that um, among our district goals for this year, uh, there is one that is not connected to construction or COVID. Um, and that is um, the identification of best practices and coordination across the district for, um, for tech implementation. Uh, and we have begun our conversation about what that looks like for us moving forward. Um, 
that conversation has begun by talking about a need to identify some of the really incredible work that has come out of necessity in this time, but that has, um, has created opportunities for growth and deepening of practice that um, we didn't anticipate, but that we wanna hold on to. Um, and so the tech committee has, has begun thinking about those and how to serve the district really as a, as a thought partner um, in pivoting toward what our tech integration and instruction looks like post COVID. So I'm sure there'll be much more to come on that, but that's an exciting pivot for us to be making. Great, any questions from the board? I don't have a question, just a comment. Um, Meredith, I, I appreciate kind of the thought that you're putting in and, and the rest of your team, the administrators on getting that data workshop ready for us. Uh, so it sounds great. I can't wait to, to see what you guys come up with. Thank you. All right, next up is superintendent's report. Good evening. I have a couple of items that I want to share with you in addition to what's listed on the agenda. Um, first of all, um, and we don't have a lot of public here, but I just wanted to say it in case someone can spread the word to others. Um, our, we have our pre-K and K registration coming up and we've tried to get the word out through our newsletter. We've sent the word out or it's coming out in the Orna Observer. I'm sure that um, Kristen's newsletter is going to have it in there as well, or maybe already has, but we're doing things just a little differently this year with uh, giving the opportunity for some um, filling out paperwork online and sending them into us uh, electronically um, so that we can obviously have some precautions with COVID. So that window opens up March 4th. So uh, if you know families in the area who are in that, um, that, that, stage of having an incoming pre-k or care uh, please uh, remind them of that and uh, there'll be a link on our website right Kristen I think it's going to be a link on the website where you can go to download the paperwork so that begins uh, later next week right it's hard to believe March 4th is later next week um, but on the 11th is when they'll actually have in-person appointments that you can make if you wish to come in to either pick up and fill out paperwork or come in to return paperwork. Um, also, I just wanted to mention school calendar is not on this agenda. We talked last time that I wanted to give it kind of a month to uh, ruminate and, and get a little more feedback from the region before we did a second read. So we'll bring back our calendar um, this next month, this next meeting uh, at the beginning of March for a second read with, with our board. Um, I just wanted to follow up on something Mirda said. I'm really, really pleased that the tech committee is pivoting to look forward. That's been work that we've long wanted to in, um, engage in in our district since I've been here. And I'm really excited at the momentum that um, the technology committee brings to work on this for our district. Um, I think it goes back to something that, you know, our community asked of us a couple of years ago around our use of technology and, and um, having some discussions around that. And I think when we, when we think about um, the impact technology has on instruction at all levels and in so many ways, I think uh, this work is critically important for us to engage in. So I just applaud their work and, and thank Meredith for her leadership in that area. I look forward to us moving forward with um, getting a framework um, established for how we're using technology and what experiences we want students to have with technology during their time with us. So I'm ready to shift to discussion items if, unless there are questions on any of that. Any questions? Nope. I mean, I would just comment in general, the technology pivot is great, but I suspect is there's a lot still to manage with COVID and I don't want to curse us, but in general, I suspect at the high level of the board, we're probably going to have start to have education pivot discussion probably come out of the data workshop too, but definitely a direction to start thinking about next year. Yes, I mean, I think as we're as we're thinking about budget for next year, I think we've begun to begin we've begun to think about next year and how we carry some of the things that we have um, maybe 
learned or changed in, in terms of tools or new licenses or apps we have and how that translates into moving forward. And I think that's kind of where we are in our, in our thinking now. Certainly we have, um, you know, about 12 weeks, 12 weeks left in a school year or maybe a little more than that. I think it's more like actually uh, 14 weeks left in the school year. But uh, it, it feels like it's a good timing to begin to think about that work. So really pleased to, to hear about that. Um, so shifting to the COVID discussion, a um, couple of things before we look at the numbers that, that I provided in the um, board packet. Um, we, as you know, transitioned um, beginning yesterday with sixth grade return to full in-person at the middle school. That was the change that happened at the middle school yesterday. And, and checking with Richard, really things went pretty smooth. They had a couple little things they needed to look at and make adjustments. And they uh, did that today and it seems to have worked well. Um, so um, that seems to be a successful transition. Um, also this week, we, as you may remember, shifted to 10th grade, having the opportunity to be full in person at the high school. We're in those three week rotation phases. So just before February break, 11th grade finished their three week rotation. So yesterday, 10th grade started their three week rotation. And then we'll finish out this quarter in three weeks with ninth grade having their four week rotation. Um, as we, as we kind of turn to looking at the numbers, one of the things that we've been talking about, um, particularly at the high school is, um, you know, identifying students who appear to need something different than the lane they're in, whether it's in remote and it doesn't seem to be working well or in hybrid doesn't seem to be working well. And the high school's uh, really done quite, quite a bit of, um, Kind of strategy to, to work on that by asking staff to um, identify students who, who they feel like either academically or socially, emotionally could benefit from more time. And then the, um, the you know, team uh, has reached out to them, those students and families to see if um, they can work with them to, to help bridge whatever is keeping them from having more in-person time. I, I would say that, and, and Reg, please correct me if you feel like I'm misstating here, but I think they have made some headway and with some students in, in um, encouraging families to consider an option for change to more in-person time. Um, if you look at the numbers for the high school, um, while the you know remote numbers really are, are pretty steady since the beginning of January, you know we're we're kind of getting more students over in that full-time column from probably hybrid is where those students are mainly coming from. Um, but, you know, we're running into some just people who are not interested in making a change also that, that we feel like a change might be beneficial, but for either, uh, you know, COVID concerns and wanting to remain either more pot in more of a potted situation or, um, remain in remote, or sometimes it's peer related that they don't want to make a change for peer related reasons um, that some families are just not interested in making that change and students. Um, but given all of that, we continue to, you know, look at data and uh, reach out to families who and students who we feel like um, something is not working well and, and we want to encourage a change. Um, but in looking at the numbers, you can see, obviously we said that all of ASA and really up in middle school have the opportunity to be full in person. And you can see the remote numbers remain really constant at those levels, pretty constant. Um, and at the high school, um, what's been interesting is through 12th, 11th and 10th grade, Reg pointed out this week, you know, um, even though those grade levels are, are pretty different in size, I think 10th grade has about 20 or so more students than the senior class. We're getting in the 40s. When we offer a class full-time attendance opportunity, we have you know, somewhere in the mid 40s of students who take advantage of that. Um, so that's been interesting to see that the response rate is not quite what people indicated on surveys in terms of 
um, the, their expression, that that would be their preferred model, and then when it's offered, what they actually opt to do. It'll be interesting to see what happens with the freshmen. They're going to start doing the kind of, um, you know, person by person freshman um, surveying next week to get more accurate numbers of what freshmen plan to do when they have their uh, turn for the three week rotation. Um, we, we anticipate it will be higher than 40s. Um, we already have, as you can see, 27 attending full in person due to kind of uh, targeting students who that model is most beneficial for them and, and some learning or academic or emotional needs, social emotional needs they have, uh, but just by virtue of them being a bigger class. Um, one of the things uh, also that the high school's been working on uh, sent out prior to vacation and closed, I think just before we went out for February break is a survey direct to students to just do a check-in with them, um, both on academic, social, emotional, um, other um, kind of just soliciting feedback. Um, and uh, Reg and Sam have been working on kind of organizing that data. Uh, taking some initial look at that with uh, the guidance staff and then plan on working with uh, the, the staff at large to look at that data and respond. Um, but kind of immediately there was an option for students to kind of list their name and, and request someone contact them and, and that, that part has been done. Sam's done that outreach. Um, and so, you know, that yielded some interesting data and, and um, when we maybe have more information to organized and, and ready to share, we'll certainly bring you back some feedback on that. Um, I would say our um, next step with, um, with looking at attendance models and, and what we might do um, beyond what, where we are now is really just looking at high school for fourth quarter. We, we have a plan that takes us through the end of quarter three. Um, and as we've said, you know, our, our priority for quarter four is that senior group of seniors. But beyond that, we really think we need to survey again just to see where people are. And then using that information, develop some plans for quarter four. So um, we'll start working on that survey um, probably next week or so to get that out to collect some information because we have to do kind of that survey and then we have to do like the circle around to get actual commitments of you're doing this or that. So um, that will probably start in the next week or so. I don't have anything else on the numbers. I would say that, you know, I feel uh, positive about where we are. Again, you know that we had a um, high school full remote day last Friday. Um, you know, again, it just comes down to with certain cases, it impacts staffing to the level that we just have to um, say we, we can't have in-person instruction and that's the biggest issue that we've seen so far. And I think that's common at a lot of schools, certainly schools around us that have been in the media, uh, that's been the primary issue. Um, but overall, comparatively, I certainly feel fortunate with where we are and, you know, am encouraged by the numbers that I see um, in our state and, and even in our county. So, um, you know, I think the last thing that I that I hope to see is more news on vaccines for our staff. Um, and there's just no news coming. I, I think everyone, you know, you see the same thing I see. I don't have any inside information on that other than the commissioners, you know, assuring us that she's out there advocating uh, for, for our staff, for educators in our state, um, but that it's a supply issue and really the, the state is not going to uh, communicate any further plans beyond what they've communicated until there's greater supply. So we hope to learn something more in the, in the coming weeks about that, but um, that's something that I really hope happens sooner rather than later. But um, you know, as soon as I know something, I'll certainly share it with staff and with you all. Any um, other comments or uh, questions and administrators, if I've left something important out, feel free to chime in. Just, just a comment, but as always, I guess, what a, an amazing amount of work is going into all of, and this is all extra work. So um, again, hats off to administrators and staff um, for 
continuing to work on this. Uh, great to hear that the middle school is off to a good start. I assume we didn't hear anything about ASA working it with all the students. So I think that's obviously good news. Um, and uh, look forward to hearing what's going on, what's going to happen. When does Q4 start? Uh, Reg, Richard, what's that date? April 5th, Monday, April 5th. April 5th, okay, cool. Yeah, and Great. I didn't mention ASA just because I think we've had a meeting since they've been back full in person. Yeah, so that's... it wasn't new at this point, but I think uh, everything continues to go well. Um, at no ASA. news is good news. And uh, ASA uh, staff and students were treated to a nice some nice surprises when they came back because some of the... Um, construction barriers had been removed. And so it kind of opened up a couple of key critical hallway spaces. So it really feels nice and open in there. Um, a nice sign of progress on the um, construction side, but also just having more room is good during these times. So that was a nice, uh, helpful surprise. Any other questions or feedback? Uh, the other thing I would mention, um, I don't have an update on spring sports, except that uh, Mike told me that the MPA is meeting March 3rd. Um, and I presume that probably coming out of that meeting or, or perhaps you know a couple of meetings around that time would be spring sports guidelines. Um, I think Mark, you mentioned to me before the meeting that, it, that wrestling might be holding things up a bit, um, but you know, I think uh, many of us are looking forward to the spring sports season. It will be a nice time for um, students to be able to be outside and get exercise, be active and, um, you know, like the fall season, probably have less restrictions than what we've had during the winter season with more indoor based activities that had to have more restrictions on them. So, but we'll see what MPA puts out. So hopefully we'll have something to bring you at the next board meeting. Reg is on that committee or one of the committees. Reg, do you have any extra insight to that? No, not at this point. Anything else on that? Okay, shall we move to budget? So um, we've Put together documents that are very similar to the style that we usually um, examine uh, throughout budget season. These are kind of our guiding documents for our work. And there are three uh, primary pages um, that, that we'll be looking at tonight, but also a couple of kind of additional data points that we've, you asked for and we talked about um, bringing to the meeting. So I think I'd like to start with the data points and then kind of go into the detailed documents, if that's okay. Um, if we could start by looking at the class um, size data. Um, yes, yeah, so it's a series of, uh, it was a spreadsheet with three or four tabs at the bottom. I think it was called class, class size data. Um, so on the first tab of that, there was, there was ASA data that shows uh, this year's enrollment and then what's projected next year. There aren't any surprises in that. Um, we've uh, moved forward with our same configuration we have now for grades K through four, which next year will be uh, grades one through five at ASA. And um, the piece though that still is uh, unknown is what the pre-K and K enrollment will be. One of the things that Kristen and I looked at today is um, we looked, pulled out the enrollment study and kind of dusted it off to see what it said about K. And, you know, actually uh, this next year of K shows a quite large uh, projection for what that study back in 2017 predicted based on the uh, births on record for whatever five years ago was. I think it was 2016 at that time. Um, so it'll be interesting because we've had some years where the enrollment study proved to be fairly accurate, but two years ago, for example, with the class that's in first grade now, it wasn't altogether accurate. We had a lot more move-ins to the community than that study showed in the, in the birth rate. 
So it will be really interesting to see if the kindergarten class, um, how it comes, how it comes in. Um, I can say to you that if it comes in at the level of the enrollment study, we're going to have some further talking to do because it will it will be something we'll have to to look at staffing staffing wise. What, what um, did the enrollment study project, Meredith? It said sixty one. Oh, yeah. So oh. It, I mean, I that was a surprise to me, um, but it will be interesting to see how far out that data holds. Um, so when I mentioned that to Kristen today, I mean, we both, uh, you know, felt like that was important to mention tonight, just as a point of reference for where we might have to circle back to this discussion to look at, you know, what we get yeah. for uh, kindergarten enrollment, and then what also comes in over the next uh, month or so after that. I think uh, Lisa mentioned the special education numbers in um, her um, report, but we put them on here for your reference as well. ACE has held really pretty steady over the years. I would say, you know, the that's about a six student kind of ebb and flow over the years. So not a lot of change happening there. The middle school numbers, uh, no surprises here. We really just roll up those fifth grade numbers into the sixth grade and then use the existing um, numbers for the other two grades. I think this is going to be the lowest OMS has been in a while in terms of enrollment because, you know, we have some um, grade levels that are certainly higher or lower, and we just happen to be in a time frame where three of the lower enrolled um, groups are in the middle school at the same time. So you can see um, th those numbers go down by about, it's looking like 18. We typically do get some additional students in at the middle school with um, some of the, there are some communities around us that offer choice beginning in middle school. And then sometimes we get more superintendent requests in middle school. So I do anticipate these numbers will grow slightly. Um, I just had an email today from a family that has been away from us on superintendent agreements looking at coming back and they have two middle schoolers. So stuff like that will continue to happen. Uh, but this is what we know of today. I would say one of the most notable things about the middle school is the change in special education numbers that Lisa referenced. And that's something that will likely be a part of the restructuring to help address the increase in numbers we're seeing at the high school. Um, so when we added, we added a new position in special ed a couple of years ago, because it was when we were kind of busting at the seams going into the um, 1920 school year. So looking at um, for next year, um, how we can help address the, the really growing and unmanageable caseloads at the high school. And then you see with the high school, as, as you know, it's um, kind of a, a, a very different kind of uh, calculation when it comes to looking at class size, it's not as straightforward. So what we've done is here is give you a couple of different ways to look at it, both, um, and, and we're just looking at this year as well, because it's, it's difficult to project um, next year, but we'll do that a little bit when we start looking at subsidy. So looking at this year, you can see that we have um, a total enrollment of 373 with, you can see that um, the class size ranges where the majority of classes are between that 10 and 19. And then we have some that are in that 20 to 29 and then some that are in that less than 10. Um, and then we give you the, the department um, mean and median class sizes. And um, I would say that, you know, looking at health, that's primarily a ninth grade course. And so that's being driven up this year by our ninth grade, that's a, a really large class. And other than that, um, you know, we, social studies is, is high, similarly um, being driven up by the, the high ninth grade class. And, um, and then English, math and science are, are pretty similar. And then the other areas are kind of clustered um, in a similar range. Um, the special education enrollment you can see, you know, has grown by just over 20 since back in 1718. 
or the projection is for that. So um, with next year's numbers going up again by a factor of another 12, that's really something that we have to address. And that's why Lisa's looking at this and, and going to be doing some restructuring. Hey, Meredith, can, can I ask, I know, you know, looking at the mean is always a little bit dicey, but it's, it's the best thing and only thing we can do, but would it be safe to say for world languages that that might be fairly misrepresented? We may have classes of 20 something and we may have classes of seven. Does, does that happen? Just because it seems like I've heard that in the past and I'm just curious, you know, always managing to the mean is tricky, so. Yeah, I mean, I have the raw data and, um, you you may have some lows and highs when you're looking at a mean, but um, in that particular example, I looked and there's only one class that's over 20, and then there are some you know some of our advanced languages are in the you know single digits, Seven and eight. so um, all right, we have right. that across every department where things like that happen. Is I, I, it's so it's not more pronounced with with languages. Uh, not not in this year's data there no. there aren't like I said there was only one class that I saw in the numbers that was um, in that 20 to 29 range um, all the others were either less than 10 or in that 10 to 19. I think that actually might be useful for us to take a look at is by subject area and um, the number of classes that are under 10 between 10 and 20 and over 20. I mean I think I'd be interested in seeing that. Um, you know, just to know, I mean, the, the, the mean and the median are helpful, but if the mean becomes much less helpful, if we've got a bunch of outliers on, on each end of the distribution. So I think I'd like to see that kind of by category. I mean, it doesn't have to be, you know, terribly detailed, but under 10, 10 to 20, and then 20 plus. I can't imagine we have anything 30 plus, but I guess if we do, I would like to know that too. Right now, it, there's, there are no classes listed in the 30 plus on here. Okay. So um, we don't have any in that range. And um, I mean, we can certainly give you that. And I guess, you know, I, I wonder what question you're trying to have answered with that. If we can help answer that tonight, I certainly can answer that because we've looked at it pretty carefully, Reg and I. And by subject area, I guess would be, I'd be most interested in. I, it would seem to me that a math class of 25 students would be very different um, than maybe an English class. I, I just said, I'd like yeah. to know, um, or a physics class, right? If we had a physics class of 25, I'm gonna be a little bit more concerned than if it's another class. So I, my subject area would probably be useful. Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, it just won't give us like what the class is. Certainly we can answer questions about it uh, to other than like a science class, there's a full range of between AP and, you know, biology classes. So we can certainly give you that um, if that, if you think that's helpful for your decision-making process. Um, and, um, you know, in looking at the numbers, you know, what I see is, I think last time we pulled these, um, these groupings of how many do we have at less than 10? How many do we have at 10 to 19? How many at 29? I think we're, you know, we've been running pretty lean uh, in the last year or so. Um, and with the increase in enrollment, I, I see that we're at a point where we're going to have to kind of stand behind what we've said we were going to do, which is make adjustments as enrollments change. And the question is, you know, where, where are the places we need to make the adjustments? Um, and, you know, Reg and I were talking a little bit about this today. And when I look at health, I say, gosh, health is the highest one. But then health is managing the bubble this year. That's the largest bubble that they'll probably see um, in the next, you know, five to seven years based on what we see in the numbers coming up. Um, so health is probably fine with the current staffing they have. And so where else do we see where they're going to be pinched when you have not just a large ninth grade class this year, but a very large ninth and 10th grade class when you consider them together and, and what courses, you know, departments have to offer to serve that great, that set of grade levels, I think is, is why we bring the recommendation we do around um, adding staff in, in English for next year. You know, the other area that kind of jumps out is social studies. And I, Reg talked about that today with me and said, you know, they have looked at it and have a plan for how to, how to manage that. 
So we can certainly bring that that follow up information or I can send it to the board actually I'll, I'll send it to you because that's easy for us to get pulled together um, in the next day. Any other questions or comments about the class size information. Again, I would say the kindergarten enrollments the kind of big question mark that's that's looming that we'll have to address when we see what those numbers end up being. Um, the other thing I put in the folder, uh, Leo requested some information last meeting about um, staffing um, changes that we've made. And, and so I, uh, Sue and Lynn put together just the summary of, you know, who uh, was hired during this for this school year. Was it um, something that we had planned for during budget or was it something that was added post budget, you know, due to COVID? Um, and where was that paid from? And then what are we planning to move forward to next year? So, um, you know, the, the positions that we added during budget time were the ASA um, first grade teacher. We removed the two ed techs, but traded that out to have a um, full teacher, a fourth classroom. We added the curriculum coordinator position that was a combination of budget and our title grants. We um, removed a half uh, time teacher at OMS that had been there for a couple of years to, um, to help staff the increased numbers at the middle school with the large cohorts that they were seeing come through. So that was removed um, at the beginning of this year. And then during this school year, we added the um, and by the way, those first two, the ASA teacher for first grade that will next year move to a second grade uh, position and the curriculum coordinator, our positions were recommending continuing in, um, into next year paid for in the same way. And then the ones that we added this year due to COVID response, you can see listed the ASA remote teacher um, that serves K through two and that one we are not recommending that we need to continue that into next year. The nurse assistant that we hired this year, we are recommending continuing that next year. Um, we are recommending that that one be put into our regular budget, but we plan on having that person serve um, to assist with special education special transportation for a small portion of the day, which is why you see that 86% there, the rest of it's in special education. Um, it, can't be, it can't be covered with the CARES, is that why? Because it's in special ed, it can't be covered with the- um, Well, we're, we're suggesting that be, that be in regular, um, the regular budget. We haven't slated that for CARES. Could, can it technically not be, or you just, this is just a choice? Um, it was a choice. I feel like it's, I'm a little uncertain about it being in CARES. I think there's probably a rationale to continue it in CARES. Um, but I think there's also a rationale to not continue it in CARES. So it's in the budget at this time. I mean, the other thing, and this could be a good thing or a bad thing, but putting it in CARES is basically a one-year extension right, rolling it into the permanent budget is kind of saying we're thinking that's going to be there on a permanent basis and we're not going to create a cliff, a cliff that we fall off when CARES ends. So, I mean, yeah. you, can argue, you could argue it either way and I probably, we don't know the answer until we look at the bigger picture part of the budget, but um, yeah. that's a factor too. Yeah, we can certainly circle back to that to discuss right. it more. Um, the tech assistant is one that was paid for with the CRF grant this year that position, we are suggesting we continue that through ESSER. Um, just with all of the uh, tech that we've acquired through this, we're going to need some support to continue that. Um, that too will be a position that will be difficult to have ever go away. Um, I think it's long been overdue in this district that we have something like that, but um, how we structure that position and fund that position is something we're probably gonna to need to discuss. Um, the core ed tech this year we paid from CRF. Certainly I think it's continued to, continues to be something that we can easily justify with students ongoing um, 
needs through our alternative ed program to be able to expand the the capacity of that program as we have this year. Um, the art teacher at ASA, we expanded it out this year with CRF to be able to have more flexibility with scheduling specials around some of the um, scheduling changes we put into place and to be able to serve remote students. Um, so that will go back to its regular uh, um, level of uh, 0.83 next year. And then we've already mentioned last meeting, but wanted to list them here, the, the additional changes that we're recommending for next year, the addition of a halftime uh, teacher at the high school in the English department, taking on uh, a portion of the JMG salary given the end of that grant to support um, our JMG program, um, adding some um, funds in our budget to support uh, staffing for special ed transportation to be able to utilize our, our newly acquired vans. Um, we would have to increase our special education transportation line by about 32,000 next year if we don't do this. So it's really kind of a net savings of about 16,000 to do it this way and to use our vans. Um, and then the removing the uh, speech language pathologist assistant position. So those are the um, kind of ins and outs of um, this current year compared to next year of staffing that you requested. Um, Meredith, can you explain the ESSER money to me a little bit? Yeah, ESSER is this newest round of, of uh, COVID relief money that we received. So um, we've received, I think four, rounds of relief money, not counting the special child care money and not counting the adult ed money. So we had CRF one and two uh, that all ended, you know, kind of were slated to end very quickly, but then ended up getting extended. And then we had the original round of CARES money, which they changed to call ESSER one. And that was the 94,000. And then we got this last round of ESSER two money which was, I believe, around 390 something thousand um, that we got just uh, late January, early February. And the, um, the two Essers, the original 94,000 in this last round uh, go for a couple of school years. So we have more flexibility with that money to use them over the first round of Esser uh, wraps up in 2022 and ESSER 2 wraps up in 2023. Did I get all that right, Meredith Lynn? Anything to correct on that? Okay. It's, you need kind of a flow chart with all of these different buckets of money. With the, with the JMG, um, that's jobs for main grads, right? Yes. And how long do they provide, do they provide grants for that role? So we've had that program now, this is the fourth year, I believe, right? Four years. And it was originally slated to only be grant funded fully for three years, but they got an extension. I think due to COVID, they were able to get some more money to, to extend the full funding of it for a uh, fourth year. So we got a bonus year on the original grant. So this is the year that to continue the program, we need to be able to provide some financial support. So it's, I would say around a fourth of what the program costs is what we're having to kick in. The, um, you know, JMG pays for the rest. Can, can you, sorry, maybe not the best time, I guess, but is, is that a class that they sign up for? Or how, how does that work? And maybe if this isn't a good time, then maybe you can learn about that another time. Yeah, Red, do you wanna give just a quick summary? Yeah, so we have a uh, you know JMG teacher, um, and um, it's a class that juniors and seniors sign up for, and uh, it's part of their schedule. You know, block one, block two, three, four. So it is okay. Uh, yeah, gotcha. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, and I, sorry, just follow up on JMG. If you're about to leave that topic, Leo. Yep. Just, I'm just wondering how we would measure impact for that number of students who's gone through the programs, probably one of them, but um, 
I don't know, it would be number of students who got jobs or number of students who went on to college? What, what would be other impact factors we could assess for JMG? Well, I think the first one you mentioned was numbers because I just remember when we started three or four years ago, I was concerned whether we would have enough numbers in JMG. It's funny, they recommend this regardless of the size of the school, but they uh, shoot for 35 to, kind of 35 is the minimum for a successful program. Um, so 35 to 40. And I wasn't sure we would get that, you know, in a school of, you know, 340 at the time, but we've been in the 40s. I think we have 42 students in there this year. So a consistent enrollment in that is a key. And so, um, and then JMG itself, just the, you know, the statewide program, there's a lot of follow-up. So Kelsey Weldon is our JMG um, you know, teacher. And part of her job is to follow up with our graduates. So I th we can get some data on kind of what, you know, what our graduates, the JMG graduates are doing and you know, how many enrolled in college and all that stuff. So that's, that's part of the program is to, to follow them, I think for two years after they they graduate. Yeah, it seems like a great program and I'm fully supportive of it, but it just seems like with this transition, it'd be a good time to do a little bit of uh, assessment of impact and to communicate that. Yeah. Go ahead, right, We could ask um, Kelsey to come and provide some information to you at a subsequent board meeting. That'd be great. Um, yeah, definitely be interested to, to, yeah, to learn I, more. Yeah, I will just say JMG is really data-driven as a... Uh, you know, as a program. So mm -hmm. I think that's a great idea, Meredith. Um, I, I wanted to ask about the, the additional core ed tech position as well. I think you said there's around 20, 25 students or in, in, in the core program. And is that with, is that, does that core, does that ed tech, is that a third position or a second position? What is that? How many so the core staff? program has two teachers and that's what we've had for, I guess, I don't know, since the program started, maybe. I'm not sure if it's been since I've been here, we've had two teachers in the program. And with two teachers, they've had a capacity of around 17 or so students in the program. Um, and adding the ed tech for this year um, allowed us to expand that capacity up in the mid to upper 20s. Um, and uh, we, as I, uh, Leah had requested some information that I emailed him and we have 22 students in the program right now, uh, around three more currently in the referral process for the program. Um, the other thing that it allows us to do is to um, have some special education support available in the program for students. Um, and so it opens up that uh, program to to really students who need some uh, additional services in the program. Um, and, and I can say this year, it's really helped us bring some kids back into uh, successful, you know, um, schooling by giving that option um, when remote wasn't quite right, but being at, um, you know, being in the high school wasn't quite right. And so CORE's, being able to expand has really been important for us this year. And so we think that it will continue to be important next year. And kind of connected here is, would JM, JMG be an option for someone in CORE or? No? We do have students from CORE come and participate in electives uh, programs. I think JMG is a good example of uh, something that some students come over to participate in but they also come over to, to do some other specialized electives as well. Is Thanks. that right, Reg? Yeah. Thank you. Can I ask a follow-up on that? I remember when we discussed, and I think maybe I'm wrong on this, but I think we had discussed the possibility of adding this um, core ed tech even before kind of COVID. And then we ended up being able to fund it with this. And, and I, if I remember correctly, I think we were told that there had been traditionally been a wait list for core and that adding this position would allow us to um, either reduce, if not eliminate that wait list. Mm -hmm. Is that been the case or do we still have a wait list? 
Reg, I'm gonna ask you to answer that. Yeah, yep, no, we, um, there is a kind of a referral process. So a student might get on that kind of referral list, but it, it, I wouldn't call it a wait list like we've had in the past. And, okay. and the other thing it's allowed us to do this year is to, to, is to accept students directly into core, which is kind of a shift in philosophy, um, specifically from sending towns. Uh, they're kind of looking around for high schools that have an alternative ed program. And in the past we had had students, well, let's try out the regular high school first before you go down. But this year with that extra staff that we've, we've actually taken two or three kids directly into core and they've been successful. So that was another big, for, for me anyway, uh, reason to, have that ed tech down there. That's great. I remember you talking about that as an option as well. So I'm glad that that's actually been able to happen. And then I guess one last thing, Meredith, just so I heard you right, you said that currently we have 22 students with three more in the referral process, um, which would push us to 25. But you said that, did you say that we had been in the upper 20s at some point this year or that we could get to the upper 20s? Yeah, I think the idea was that our capacity could be 28 to 30 with the core ed tech. Uh, we feel like this year with COVID, we probably shouldn't go right. quite to that level, given the distancing we're trying to maintain. So I think we're setting it at about 25, 26 this year. But, um, you know, moving forward, if we can remove the restrictions, we think uh, 28 to 30 is, a, is the right spot for that um, capacity. With, with this position. And then, and theoretically, we could get through 22, 23 with ESSER money. Is that? Potentially, yeah. I mean, okay. the, the other thing, as I mentioned last meeting that we're working on right now is summer intervention plans and any other intervention plans that we want to put into place next year with our ESSER money. So, you know, it's one of the reasons I'm not wanting to stack it up with a lot of stuff right now until we can develop these plans and, and make sure we have the funds in ESSER to, to fund those. But potentially, you know, with ESSER 2 going through 2023, you can get two school years out of that money. Thank you. So um, let's let's shift to look at kind of the revenue and then expenditure summary, and then we can drill back into some of these details if you have other questions as you see the, the big picture. So there's a cover sheet that's just the, the summary, the one pager that has revenues and expenditures. Let's just sit that aside and go to the two sheets that follow that because those give a more detailed step-by-step -step of, each, of each line. So starting with the revenue page, um, Lynn's done a great job of putting together um, our revenue in a way that um, I think I'm really comfortable with her um, projections on this. The two things that are not, well, they're preliminary that the state has only given us preliminary allocations and that's the state allocation number that's up. 149,748 at this point. And then the local required allocation that the state has issued to us on our preliminary ED279. And that increase that's required of our local assessment is 39,601. So those are the first two lines. And so that's been given to us on the ED279. And you know it may or may not change as the legislature moves through their process with budget. They've got a ways to go on that and probably, you know, more so than any year, just a lot of unknowns. And so I wouldn't be surprised if um, ED 279 has got adjusted somehow along the way. But this is what we are basing our, our numbers on at this point. If I can just jump in, that local allocation actually represents a very tiny decrease in mill rate. I think it's 0.02 drop in mill rate, but it's, um, it's gone up because of increased property values. Yes, thank you for adding that. So the tuition um, line for regular student education, um, we're looking at an increase right now of 169,000, which is really a, a helpful subsidy increase. And that comes from really Lynn adjusting based on the surge we saw late summer and into this year of tuition students that we hadn't planned on in this year's budget. When we kind of sealed our budget last year and said, okay, this is the one we're putting forward. We were right at what we had projected. And then there was this late surge of students transferring in and we've continued to see some of that actually as the year has gone on. So her calculation here replaces our 24 seniors 
assuming we'll get at least that many in this incoming freshman class. And it's really a pretty large class at a couple of our key sending schools. Um, but it also is increasing by the additional 14 students, tuition students that we have above what we budgeted last year. So um, even with 169,000, I think it's still a pretty conservative estimate. So we might, you know, be able to adjust up. It, it, it really is so hard because we often don't get commitments until late and it, it just is really uh, difficult to go beyond really what is known at that time. So, uh, but it does give us a nice bump this year to help us with our revenue side of um, our picture. Additionally, the special ed tuition is seeing a pretty large increase and that's due to uh, um, Lisa Smith and, and Lynn kind of working on our tuition rate calculations and um, aligning those with uh, how other districts in the area are charging tuition and, and trying to recover costs for some areas that, um, that other districts uh, commonly charge. And so we, we did a kind of a recalculation and it was beneficial for us to um, increase our revenue uh, for our special ed tuition. The next four lines are just kind of in our, um, the charts uh, are actually not, the, the, the interest income is just a reflection of the, the interest market. I mean, we're just, you know, getting almost no interest on our um, accounts in, in both our bond account, but also our, our you know, operating account for just district operating um, revenue. Um, and so typically we would see around $19,000 interest, but right now, based on what we're getting, we just don't feel comfortable going beyond around three. Uh, the next three though, are just part of the, um, the bond um, kind of charts for how we expect to see interest and uh, return revenue and what Glenburn will owe us on the uh, joint bond that we have together. So that's just kind of set in the charts for, for what we're um, going to get this year. E-rate, we don't have any information yet on um, any changes for E-rate. So we're just carrying forward kind of what we've done before on there. And we don't really know yet about laptops. We're still waiting to see what's going to happen with the MILTI program and, and not sure about what we'll do with surplus laptops. So we don't have anything to put there at this point. And then what we've done is we've carried forward and balanced forward the amount that we've used in the last couple of years for our um, use of our unassigned. We've pulled out that extra 600,000 we put in for the extra COVID contingency. And so just moved it back to that um, 816,902. That's not a very round number, is it? I think we were trying to achieve a certain uh, amount of tax increase one year. And so we put it at that kind of odd figure, but we've left it there the last, I think, two years before we added that 600,000. So, you know, when you, when you add all of that up um, and, and then, you know, the, the additional locals really tied to the next page on expenditures, um, it shows, you know, that additional um, 608, of revenue this year, 608-104. Any questions on the revenue page? I've got one and it's it's really, well, one, I had two, but one I think you answered one and they both have to do with tuition. Um, I was gonna ask if even with this increase it represented kind of the traditional, very conservative Lynn early estimate. And it sounds like, I, I would assume it does. She's smiling and I think you said it did. So I'm, I assume that's true. And then the other question, I guess, maybe is for Reg, uh, just kind of wondering if you or any of your staff had heard any feedback yet from the initial kind of open house. I know that one is in the books and there's others coming up, but I'm just wondering if you'd heard anything yet. Um, no. <laughs> other, than, yeah, other than, you know, some positive comments that, you know, people appreciated it and thought it, you know, thought it was well done, but um, not anything as far as like, um, you know, sign ups or yeah, it's still early it's enrollments. Still. Yeah. Do you April have any sort of number comparisons, Reg, compared to what we would see on a in person versus what we saw that attended? Were they I'm I'm just I'm curious if it was lower than you know, 
significantly lower than the on-site kind of thing or not. I Yeah, I think it was lower. We had 60 something people in there, but there were about 20 who were, you know, teachers, you know, current students. So we had in the 40s. I would say if we were going to be in the library, you know, the library is always full. So the library would probably be like 60 people or something, you know, so. Probably not alone. I was just curious what. How, yeah, how yeah. That so I think out. it was. Um, I would say it was lower than if we had had it in person. Yeah. Do we know number of eighth grade students, uh, you know, the in surrounding sending districts last year versus this year? I think last year it was a big jump up in students from the year prior to that, but I'm just curious what happening this year. Uh, I've been talking with the guidance counselors to answer your question, Mark. I'm, I'm con constantly asking them if they have any word yet, how many from what schools, just to make sure that our number is first safe. And then, you know, can we increase it? Obviously, if we can, we want to. Um, but only thing that I heard initially was that the numbers um, were close to last year. I think last year was a little bit higher, but uh, it seemed like the numbers were pretty good in eighth grades around other districts. Now, how many will choose us? I'm not sure, but it sounds like we at least have a good pool to start with. And just to clarify, our baseline, Lynn, you used what we have in the graduating senior class and just held that, right? Right. So that's, yeah. that's why it seems pretty conservative and a good thing, I think, right? Right. I mean, it's really so early. That's really the only place to start is to assume that we can replace our 24 seniors with 24 freshmen, knowing that it's there's a big pool out there. And yeah. as I get information, as we get registrations or even hear guidance from the guidance offices on the from the sending schools then I can adjust it but I think it's pretty safe to say that we will get the 24 um, but I just didn't did it add at this point safe good idea can I ask what that number is these days for standard tuition what for, per student per student for a high school student yeah um, I don't have the exact number on me but it's about eleven thousand. About 11,000. Yep. Um, just under, I mean, just over 11,000. Gotcha. I would have said 11,2, something 11, right around there. Yeah, it's, yeah. Now, is it, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Leo. No, you go. I was just wondering if that, if that tuition number is more or less or the same as we get for um, ASA or OMS superintendent agreement sub, under subsidy. Is it roughly the same? Well, we don't, we don't get it. The Sounds elementary good. tuition is actually less. Less, okay. Um, but the subsidy, we just get the subsidy per child that which we- is, Which is less to. than high school tuition, right? Okay. Typically, um, because we get the maximum uh, rate that the state sets for tuition. Okay. Um, so that's why. Yeah, the subsidies, based on EPS, which is less than any school operates on. So it's, I forget, I think it's 6,000 something for elementary and 7,000 something for high school. But then the tuition is based on the state average tuition for or state, what is it? Yeah, state average per pupil expenditure, yeah. um, which is, um, which includes the things above EPS that everybody's doing. Right. But it doesn't, of course, quite cover the things above EPS that we're doing right. here. Right. But, but we do get at least if we have kids who are here on superintendent agreements and then they move to high school and they come as tuition students, we do get an increase. Even yes. if it still doesn't cover everything, it's more. Right. Yes, that's right. One of the, the things that we had from the enrollment study is a look at our tuition base, like the five or six um, districts around us from which we draw tuition students. And this year, for this incoming freshman class next year is is pretty much in alignment with the last couple of years that were in the 160 range back when we pulled the, the data, which is on the higher end of some years. Um, like this, this grade that's a, a senior class right now, um, they were a, a lower number when they were out in, you know, surrounding schools. So, um, next year, the next year, it looks like it dips a little, uh, and then it goes back up, but this is data that's several years old. So, um, that might be something that we, we can 
gather again just to have a refresh of the data for looking forward. But it does look like I think Reg had said that, you know, the reports he got um, from our guidance staff was that it looked like, you know, a, a substantial um, class coming in from our primary sending sending towns. Can I just ask that 600,000, is that from a contingency fund or is that from a carry forward fund? And, and are those two, do we call those two separate, are there really two separate things or do we call them interchange? Do we interchange those terms? In my world, they're the same, but for Lynn, they're probably different. <laughs> <laughs> so contingency is in the expenditure side and the carry forward is the revenue side. So we put the money in the contingency to use wherever we need it for an expenditure. And then we put the carry forward in the revenue to offset those so that it didn't increase our budget. But on the revenue side, it comes from our unassigned fund balance. Right. That's unassigned what you mean. fund balance, which our carry forward ultimately goes into, but it's a year later. Is that correct? Well, it goes Basically. in after we've already established our budget for- Yeah. Okay. Like after the audit, it tells us how much that changed. And, and what do we have in the undesignated fund? Oh, that's a figure I didn't pull today, but I think <laughs> I it's like 1.2 million. I think that's right. I don't have the audit in front of me either. But, you know, Lynn always cautions me that I have to take out the 816,000 that we have in this year's budget when I cite that number, but that's, that's the number. Of, it's around 1.2. Because we, yeah. And at this point, do we know, in the, if I'm looking at it, sorry, care, do we Did know open the predicted audit? carry forward or no? Are, are we predicting that yet or no? Well, We're we, not predicting that yet. We set that really, right? It's the amount we think we want to draw down the undesignated fund. We set the amount we put in for carry forward, the use of carry forward. Right. Right. It's not yeah. something the accountant gives us. It's a political decision. Well, but then, then it's how it shakes out at the end, right? That, that's the amount that we put into our undesignated fund, not the carry forward. So the carry uh, forward is the amount we're taking from our undesignated and putting into the next budget. We're carrying that amount forward. You're talking about at the end of the year, what's left that we put back into our undesignated fund to use for a future year. Yes. Yeah, Leah, what we've found in the past is that 816 number. If we carry that forward, that's about the amount we don't spend. So that's like a neutral number. We say we're going to take it out, but we always put that much back in. And so it doesn't change, you know, minus plus or minus $10,000. It doesn't, doesn't change the bank balance. In theory, though, Lynn cautions Meredith that you have to take that 800 out. We kind of don't because we're also putting it in. Is that... Right, it's what it's what Lynn doesn't want Brian to hear said. It 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 helps us keep not overtaxing to add to our unassigned balance, but it also helps us um, not have enough revenue in case something unforeseen happens and we spend more than we typically do. Yeah. I mean, so imagine the magic number is rounded to eight hundred thousand. Right, so if we take eight hundred thousand, that's typically what we carry out of our budget year, right? Because we don't spend every penny. We have to budget conservatively. So we don't spend 800,000. So it goes back in and our bank balance has no change at the end of the year. If we did a carry forward of 900, we'd have 800 that we don't actually spend and we would actually drop our bank balance by 100,000. If we had a carry forward of 700,000, we would be overtaxing people by 100,000 and putting it into our bank balance to bring our bank balance up. 1.3. Right. And it's a combination of not spending or getting additional revenue that we had not anticipated. Right. Um, so it's not like we're over budgeting by 800,000. It's a combination of several different factors. Yeah. And, and the crux, the crux of it is intentional, like, you know, like you said, yeah. so. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah. For a number of years, we were doing smaller numbers like 600 and we were finding that the bank balance was going up every year. So we've been dialing that number up and down and it seems like 800, 816, 820 is about the number in a typical budget year that causes the bank balance not to change. Right around 816, 902. Right. We add about three cents to that and you're, you got it right. Spot on, got it. <laughs>
Any other questions about revenue right now? So shifting over to the expenditure details, we've talked about some of this in our last meeting when we kind of gave you some highlights, but these have um, actual numbers with them that you can see here. So you can see, um, you know, current year compared to what's proposed for the 21-22 budget. Um, and then what the increase decrease is compared to the FY21 budget. And then we have that blue column that takes out the corresponding expenditures we had to put in for the 600,000 because the 600,000, we couldn't just put it in the revenue. We also had to put it in the expenditure side of things. So really, you know, I think that's the most meaningful column to look at what I would consider to be apples to apples of actual increase decrease, that blue column. So um, with, with regular instruction, we saw are seeing an increase of 144,000 um, net minus the, the extra contingency we put in. Um, you know, as always, there's going to be um, kind of the differences with uh, salary, uh, people we hire coming and going. But um, am I saying that right, Lynn? Yeah, it, it's the, the 144,000. Um, the, you can see the actual cost as we already showed you for the staffing changes there. Um, we try to capture what we think are the most significant um, changes in this area. Probably the biggest one is the multi program costs that um, we anticipate needing to do a refresh of our student devices for next year. We're still awaiting though the price sheet and the options uh, the state's been working on getting their RFP results back in and organized and sent out to districts. So we don't have that yet. So we basically carried forward kind of a, a cost that was what, what it was previously when it was uh, disseminated in previous years. Um, the MILTI, um, we took a year off from MILTI this year and we did have some costs, but they were the, the buyback cost of the current devices. So we did the buyout of those. So adding that back in is kind of a, you know, a, a big lump to, to take here. Um, and I think that, you know, what we're talking about doing is the refresh of six through 12 in this number. We feel like our elementary uh, devices are in pretty good shape. Um, particularly, you know, we've just done K2, just got uh, iPads through the, some of the CRF money. Um, we also have a couple of Chromebook carts from some state devices that we got during the COVID, um, this COVID time. Our third graders are using Chromebooks and have some, we have spare devices to refresh those as those go down because they don't last as long. And our fourth and fifth grade multi devices are, are among the best in the districts because until this year they weren't going home. They were just staying in the classroom. And that's really why how they get beat up, just the, the back and forth wear and tear. So we feel like those have some more life left in them. And so the six through 12 devices are the ones that are really tired uh, that we're seeing some, some difficulties with. And so those are the ones that are, are captured in this number. Um, and, you know, depending on the cost when they come out, you know, we may have to re-examine that, but we wanted to start with what we felt like would be probably the most, um, kind of the most that we would see expending um, with the refresh, but it all depends on how the prices come out in the, uh, in the multi program. Um, as you look down, you see, uh, hang on just a second, salary and benefit changes across multiple lines. And uh, what we've done is we've captured kind of salary and benefit increases across all cost centers that not including any kind of new or removed positions, but this includes, you know, uh, projected increases and in, in known increases in salary and projected increases in insurance, any changes that we've had over the course of the year in staffing where we made projections last year and now have actual numbers or any changes in benefit levels that have been elected for in insurance. So we've just captured all of that at the bottom there. Leah, what, did you have a question? Yeah, what, I thought uh, middle school multi was always paid for. Did that just go away? 
Well, they're restructuring how they're doing it and they're giving you money in your ED279 for seventh and eighth grade devices. And then you get a, um, we're going to be getting a um, kind of a state uh, purchase, uh, a list of purchase options that they've secured through RFPs they put out for different device options. And you use that to purchase for seventh, seventh and eighth grade or any other grades that you want to fund. So now it's a separate line in the ED-279? Yes. Is that, when did they start that, this year? This or is last the year? first year. Oh. Do yeah. we make, do you have a sense that do we make out worse or? I, I won't know until we see the costs. Hmm, interesting. I hadn't, yeah. I hadn't heard that they made that shift. Yes, um, so. There's a lot that we don't know about Milty until we get that list of what the prices are gonna look like and things like Apple Care and, and what's included with it. And I saw that number before, I can't find it right now. This is, what page is that on, on the Milty thing? It's on the detailed expenditure page that shows cost centers, regular instruction and has the listing out to the right. It's in the document that has the color sheet as the first sheet and then has uh, two 22 budget overview or details. no? 22 budget yes. overview? Yes. Yeah? All right. I, I know I saw it before and I just can't find it now. So that's all right. Was it? It's 106,000 is what's in the, the document if that's what you're looking okay. for. 106,525. I, I don't know why I can't find it. All right. So thanks. special education. Um, there's really not much new there that we didn't talk about last time when we talked about some big increases because the three that are here are pretty pretty big impacts. Uh, removing the SLP certainly is a, a cost savings and then adding support staff for special transportation at 16,000 and then projecting another out of district placement at 35. Um, so, you know, as I said earlier, we were going to have to increase our contracted special transportation by 32. Um, so we wanna use our vans to, to help take some of that on ourselves. Um, with other instruction, uh, you know, usually you like us to list what's changing with, with the stipends. This is what's known right now. And the only thing, the social media manager was in the contract. It just didn't get added into the budget last year. The other two are things that we've added since um, I think in the fall when the stipend committee met or the canoe team was in the contract also, but it just wasn't added into the budget either. Sorry, back on special, special education. I'm not figuring out the difference between the FY21 increase and the FY21 without the contingency. seems like those should differ by 120,000, but they differ by 200,000. Yeah. I can't figure that out either. That was going to be one of my questions. Lynn, um, I'd have to check the figures in the in the formula for special education program expenditures. Right. Um, let me take a peek at that. Yeah. Let me see if I can see what what's going on with that. Well, well I, I think it's a little more than one twenty thousand. You're not going to be able to add up everything to the right. Right, because that's but without the without the contingency, it should be the difference of one twenty. You're right. So Lynn can look at that and see if we have a. I'll look at it and see if there's yeah. anything that jumps out. But, but we, only pulled, we only pulled out a few things, um, but there are other differences. But let me take a peek and see if anything looks funny. Meredith, can I ask you about the, um, you were talking about the them using our own vans versus this, and you were saying 35,000, and then we were putting the 16,000 Mm -hmm. And is this 35,000 minus that 16,000 or is it just saying we're going to like plan kind of both ways and so down in total transportation. Um, that's where we put the contracted service for any transportation we use. So we had um, 32,000 or around 32 to 35,000 built in that line previously for special ed transportation and due to just a new need for next year that was going to double. 
okay in the transportation line so instead of doubling that line we're choosing to to try to tackle that one a little differently okay so that thirty five thousand is sort of separate from this yeah that was down in the total transportation line got it Any other questions before I move on? Um, on student and staff support, um, that's where we uh, have the nurse, because in that you see it's technology, it's, um, it's the nursing program, it's guidance services, library, uh, curriculum improvement of instruction. Uh, I think student assessments also in there. Um, so you can see um, the nurse uh, assistant is in there. I mentioned last time we're um, adding technology committee like we do the curriculum committee and adding some uh, um, per diem time in for, for that committee work. Um, and then request to continue some of the apps and licenses we've had this year that teachers feel like would be beneficial to continue forward is listed here. And then adding in the SAT school day administration costs that we would have to take on since the state's no longer funding that. Those are the major kind of differences that, that jumped out at us in that, that um, cost center. Is that gonna stick that the state's not funding those? That's a permanent SAT? change? Yeah. They, that's what they've said so far. Yes. Um, system administration, really the major change is adding in the equity audit, uh, some funds to help pay for that, that we want to engage with uh, for next year to further our work with um, equity and inclusion. Um, more to come on that. Um, school administration, uh, there, were there were some costs associated with our ENA contract that we discovered were not put into the budget last year, um, and those are reflected there with our uh, voice over IP phones and, and web service with ENA. Um, transportation, there's a contractual increase in our contract with SEER and then uh, fuel costs, unfortunately, are looking like they're going to be going up. Um, and then the last two lines, this year we, we had more money in facilities maintenance that we knew this year we would be flipping over to debt service, just the way our debt was structured and what where we knew we had costs this year versus next year. So that's why you see a, you know, a down 200,000 in uh, facilities maintenance and then an up 264 in debt service. We were um, paying for all of the prep work and some of the projects that we had to get ready for construction and then knew that this year, just in our amortization table, that this year was gonna be one of the higher years in our, um, debt schedule so um, it helped us balance our debt um, so when you look at the bottom one of the other things that was difficult to itemize because it's through so many cost centers is um, staff course tuition we're seeing a, a big increase in requests for that next year uh, this year uh, requests went down we talked a lot about that with staff um, and um, you know i think that uh, staff really looked carefully for this current year at what they were requesting for um, tuition requests for them for their own courses. Um, and I would just say is, you know, this this does reflect a fairly trimmed down number that we've looked at all the requests and kind of tried to gauge where we think might be the right place to budget for. We have more people in programs than we've had recently as we look through the people that have requested. So um, that's a pretty significant increase. And just to let you know, we've budgeted at this point for health and dental insurance. We've gone nine and four percent, um, kind of uh, nine for health, four for dental. We should get the health cost uh, early April. So in time to make an adjustment, hopefully, if it's a significant one, we'll certainly do that. Dental, um, we usually get that one a little later. And so we may or may not be able to make an adjustment there. Lynn, do you have any feedback for us on that other line? Um, I do. It's actually the first two lines are both off because in the initial formula, we were thinking that we had put 400 and 200 was the way that we split it between the contingencies in special ed and regular ed. Um, and then when we double checked, it was actually 480 and 120. So um, 
there's actually 200 in the special ed and 400 in regular ed, and it should actually be 480 and 120, if that makes sense. So the formula is wrong on the spreadsheet that will fix it, but the total in the end is correct. It's just those two lines are a little bit off in their differences. So the comments are correct. The comments are correct. Right. The, so the special ed increase is less 80,000 and the in regular instruction is up another 80,000. So 224 right. net, net for regular and 124 for right. SPED. Yes. But because it's just moving 80 between those two lines, the totals come out okay. Right, right. And so the, the comment is the correct number. It's just the formula when we discovered that the formula didn't get changed. So I will change that for the next one. Thank you for catching that. Any other questions or feedback at this point? on that so the kind of the i, I have the a few questions i have a few questions on this if you don't, if you don't mind uh just yeah. um one could you uh i know you said it's early yet at this but could you um give us a little insight onto what the twenty five thousand for the equity audit actually entails or gets us sure um equity audits can entail a number of aspects for what the the you know company that's giving you this feedback is examining. So we are bringing some. We're looking to bring somebody in. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's a okay. you you hire an external right. uh, provider to come in and 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 typically it includes uh, hiring practices, policies, right. enrollment practices, um, curricular elements. Uh, um, like student services elements. What else, Meredith? Is there something else that I'm forgetting in that list? Well, that figure, I'm, I mean, all of that is true. And the objective of that phase of the process is to identify uh, critical needs for moving the district forward um, with respect to its diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. And so it's a figure that, um, includes that analysis, but then has on the other end um, supported um, PD efforts, um, targeted uh, coaching, um, and a host of other pieces based on those needs that were identified that are intended to support the work. So it's both evaluative and then does have some fun for action steps too, obviously not knowing what all those action steps are going to be. Yes. my What I've learned so far is that those are are highly tailored to the findings of the audit. Right, right. Okay, great, thank you. And so the other, the only other question I, I had, well, I guess a, a comment and then a, a comment and a question. I guess the question would be, and, and Meredith, I guess you kind of answered this a little bit, was that does seem to me to be a pretty significant staff tuition increase. Um, I would kind of want to hear more about that as we, get into the details and then um, just in, and so and then in terms of a comment um, just looking at the numbers that you showed us earlier um, I know you said you talked with Reg about this but I would be interested in hearing why um, the need for this half-time English teacher is more significant than additional support in social studies when the average class size in social studies is almost two and a half students higher. Um, and also I believe the staffing in social studies is lower than the current staffing we have in English. So I'd, I'd be interested to hear more on the, the argument for that. Sure. Um, well, uh, I think the, um, the first question about the course tuition, I can just kind of generally answer that for now. Um, you know, looking at our collective bargaining agreements and what we have um, agreed to provide staff through those agreements um, and, you know, what the thresholds are for kind of the district. Um, there's a, a percentage of your budget that is cited in the contract that you will budget up to that percent. And we're not exceeding that with this and we're not exceeding what um, people are due via the collective bargaining agreements. I think one of the reasons we're seeing an increase is that in just talking about it a lot last year in negotiations and, and sending some things out to staff, uh, I think staff kind of uh, dialed back their requests more last year than typical. 
And when we're looking at this year's, um, you know, what we're seeing is we're seeing more people than we saw last year who are actually engaged in programs. So it's hard to scale it back much more than we have because no one is going beyond what, you know, is, is outlined as a benefit in the CBAs, but it's just, you know, the number of people we have taking programs and that are requesting classes. So, um, but the cumulative effect of that seemed, you know, it's significant. That's a significant increase in just that, that one area. Mary, but what we typically see is we see a lot of unspent budgeted funds in those lines every year. So we, we take what's requested and then we scale it back and we try to look at, you know, who's requested and what we know about that person and their involvement in programs or, or, you know, things that the principal can share with us about what was outlined in the request. And, and so that might be an area we go back and look further at. Um, but, you know, we've already done some scaling back of what was requested there. What I was going to add, correct me if I'm wrong, is the the requested amount typically far outweighs the actual expenditure in the end is what we've been running into prior, and that was a topic during negotiation. So there was a there was a an effort on the staff to really think about, you know, am I going to use this or am I just asking for it as a placeholder? So yeah. Um, and, you know, I think in terms of English and uh, social studies, you know, Reg and I talked a little bit about that today. They've just looked at um, sections and uh, what they're able to do now and then what they would be able to do next year with projected enrollment. And, um, you know, Reg, I will probably have you add a little more to this, but in looking at um, the ninth grade bubble, I think that's a, a part of looking at the types of courses that kids are in that are heavy writing courses. In ELA, there's a concern about those numbers and the number of sections um, required for ninth and 10th grade together. And um, with students having to have four credits of English courses, we have to maintain the, the selections for juniors and seniors and actually the other half of 10th graders as well. So we have to maintain a certain level of electives and in, in um, social studies, we've really actually cut back the number of electives to be able to uh, have, you know, the required courses with three, with three instructors. I mean, it's, it's frankly, in my opinion, not ideal. I think ideally we would be hiring half in English, half a social studies. Um, and, you know, I think it goes back to what are the required courses that department has to offer is the difference between social studies and English in my mind. And I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Reg. No, I thought you really nailed it. You know, for English, it is that, you know, that four credit requirement that, you know, kids are always taking an English, English class and also our desire to really keep those writing classes at around, you know, 15, 16, um, but in social studies, we are seeing that impact where, you know, for next year, we're going to, we're going to have to limit what we offer for electives. And so, um, yeah, so we see the same thing, Mark, you know, we see, I, I think in my ideal world, I'd, I'd hire a, a dual certified English social studies teacher for next year. Are, are our social studies courses not writing intensive as well, at least some of them or not? Uh, um, no, I would say that that there that there's writing. There's they're not as writing intensive as some of our writing classes in English. So, hmm. um, you know, but but no, there's there's writing expected for you know for all the social studies classes. But I would say the English is more writing intensive in general. I mean, I mean, some are literature based and more reading based courses, but. Our goal is to keep those English classes at a kind of a 15, 16 average. Thanks. Sure. So Reg, this is putting the cart before the horse for we even looked at the bottom line, but if somehow $30,000 showed up and we could hire a full-time dual certified English social studies, is that a position you think we could fill or is that gonna really restrict our pool to try and put that kind of a qualification on it? Um, you know, anecdotally, I've, I've worked with kind of that dual certified. Um, it's a common dual certification 
kind of in that humanities field. Um, I'm not saying it's common for people to have it, but if you are dual certified, it's common to have that combination of uh, English and social studies. So um, I, I don't know what would be out there for applicants, but. Um, I, I would I, say also, we'd probably advertise it one way. And if that wasn't successful, go with a split of, you know, two half-time individuals is another way. and and. You know, there are candidates who are looking for that kind of position, particularly, I think, in our community with uh, the university. I, I think we, we probably draw a better applicant pool or a deeper applicant pool for that type of position than other communities might. I will say, I think people are curious to see what the job market's gonna be like um, for teachers, what the impact once we get to the end of the pandemic is gonna be on uh, retirements or younger teachers who just decide to leave the profession um, or will there be a sense of <laughs> we made it through this we can make it through anything so we, we just don't know that yet All right can I just ask back on the expenditure on the on the first page and if you said it I apologize but a decrease of 255,000 in a regular instruction what, what is the crux of that? Sorry, that's the 480,000. Leah, remember actually, we were preparing for having a month of budget curtailed by the state. So we put a much bigger contingency fee, uh, fund in than we normally do. So that, that and we're not, at least at the moment, we're preparing for that for next year. So that's that's what you're uh, seeing. Okay. We so have, really, that's right. that's look, a, in, that's look in the blue column where that's taken out, and then it's it's a you know it's an increase, Col but a small column blind. So I'm having trouble with the blue, but that's right hand <laughs> column, right hand column. Green there. Um, so okay. if if I say look at the colorful sheet, I. It's this one with the yes, like, different uh, shades here. This is the sheet that I think tells the the bottom line of uh, that I think is one of the conversations that we will be engaged with over the next two months. Is you know what what kind of impact to our local community um, can be can be put forward by this board and are we comfortable with? So when you look at you know everything we've just looked at that's on the top are about revenues and that's on the bottom about expenditures. It all comes down to kind of the, the last line in the, under the revenue section, which is increase slash decrease. So that says, what is the increase in or decrease in taxes to uh, residents of Orono? And so with the revenue and the expenditure picture that we've just presented, this would represent one hundred and fifty nine thousand and thirty one dollars in increased taxes to um, our community if we put this forward as is so that's kind of when you wrap it all together probably the the thing that most people want to know because it kind of defines the work in front of us based on you know feedback we get from the board and, and I will say this is the lowest that we've uh, ever started this process with. And I, I want to commend, you know, our staff and our team for really have been having been thoughtful about budgeting and tried to put forward a budget that um, is considering the time that we're in. Um, and so I think, you know, we're at a, we're at a, a starting place that's really favorable comparatively. And that's good, but the, the the hard part of it is, you know, I don't think there's as many uh, nickels in the couch cushions as as maybe we could find in other years, just based on the type of budgeting for expenditures that we've we've done to lead us to this point. I think this is a great starting point. It's much better than we normally are at this stage, um, and obviously things things can change in either direction. Um, but if things change kind of in a positive way, then we have we have a, a 
a much easier path forward, I think, than we've had in some previous years. So I want to, I'd like to echo and thank you and, and the administrators and all the staff, because this, this to me seems like a really good starting point, especially thinking about where we've been at this point in some previous years. And that number has been a lot bigger and the decisions around that therefore have been a lot more difficult. Um, this is for me, in my view, this is a good, pretty good place to start. I, when I looked at this this morning, um, I had to look at it twice to make sure I was reading it right. So I, I think it's a good starting spot for sure. Yeah, I, I would just second that. I, I'm, you know, this is the first of about six or seven meetings we're going to have on budget probably, uh, and things change over time. So, but um, I, I think it's a really good starting point. Like you said, Meredith, part of that's because everybody was careful and there's not a lot. We're, we're down to bone already. So, but, um, you know, I, I kind of think about this and my view has always been, we don't protect people from the increased value of their own home. But I try, other than that, I try in a perfect world when it's possible, try not to raise taxes other than that piece. And so that amounts to about 40,000. You take that out and we're down to 120,000. And then I think there's a lot of reasons to think about things as one-time expenses, right? The multi is 120,000. Uh, this is the peak year of bond payments, the way bond, you probably remember the bonds are not level payment like home mortgages, they're level principal payments, which means that the payments go down every year. So uh, this is the highest year of, uh, and we finally borrowed all of our money. So this is the highest year of bond payments. It goes down, I think it goes down 20, 20, 20,000, 20,000, 3,000. Then it goes down 80,000 and then it goes back up by 70,000. So there's going to be an interesting budget management in that process. But after that, it goes down by 30, 20, 30, 40,000 every year after that. So um, I think that's another reason to treat this as a one time kind of thing. And I think all of the uh, COVID money is a reason to think about this as a one time thing. So when you look at all those one time kinds of things, you know, there's money in the um, uh, capital reserve. Um, budget, there's COVID money, $120,000 gap seems to me like something that's closable. And for that matter, we have yet to draw down the bank account. We keep saying it's time to draw it down by 50 or 100,000. And we've gone, I think, four straight years with it increased. With the last year, we got the increase down to something that was effectively zero, but it was still technically an increase. So I think, I think that's a conversation to have too. I don't want to start rating the bank account, but if it's gone up four years in a row, it's not, and this is a especially tight year, it's not a crazy year to have that go down a little bit. So I think it's way too early to start thinking through um, scenarios, uh, especially I think right now with the state and local aid being voted on and not knowing how that's gonna ripple through the state process. I think there could be some real changes and you know, we know traditionally our budgets are conservative when we start health insurance may go down, tuition may go up. So I, I, I see a lot of opportunities to close that gap and um, get down to no a no mill increase, even if there's a small tax increase due to property values, um, which would be fantastic to end up at that place. Uh, like Mark, I think there's probably the thing that jumped out at me was probably the English social studies. Um, so, you know, in the end, I think we, we're not making the schedules. We have to listen to the administrators, but I, I do think that's a topic to to probe a little bit more and think about. Um, I think are, kindergarten's the other thing we have to keep our eye on. And we have to keep our eye on kindergarten, yep. That's one of those cases where we're gonna have to pay for a year before the state subsidies catch up. But um, yeah, that, that's a very real possibility too. Spe speaking of that, Meredith, can I ask you, um, maybe a question we don't want to ask, but let's say that those projections come through and we were just hypothetically to have to add a K classroom. Do we have that space at ASA? I think there would be a way to, to figure that out. Um, but, you know, we're in the process of looking at some of that right now. Mm -hmm. So we'll probably have contingency A, B, and C for okay. how that would look next year. Yeah, great. Thank you. And the, the portables that are there right now, will those be gone in the fall or are we still going to have those? Um, we will still have them in the fall, probably. Um, we may not need them all of next year, um, but so I don't think we need to plan on their use for that purpose. Okay. Um, okay. Our, our permit actually is a temporary permit for those. So they're, and they're not plumbed, they're not designed right. to be permanent ter terminals. Uh, 
portables. Sorry. Mm, great. All right. Thank you. And they're, they're still calling the 279 a preliminary one, I assume, right? They're not saying that's the final. Right. Yeah, we've heard no update, and I don't think we would get an update until pretty late in the legislative session. Yeah, I mean, most years, the preliminary is really preliminary, but uh, last year, they gave it to us, and that was it. There was never a second one. So I think the current um, administration is trying to... Um, Budgets, you know, I think they know that giving us money in May is really a waste of our time. And so I think they're trying to be very straightforward. Um, so I give them credit for that. And I think there's a chance it's the final one. But if, you know, the budget situation in the state is so fluid, it may, may certainly may change if that changes. And do, they would, call, do they call it preliminary or no? It's just idiot. I think they do, yeah. yeah. Meredith, um, Correct me if I'm wrong. There's a maximum increase on the insurance, right? Is it 10 or 12% would be the maximum increase that we'd see? No, there's not a maximum really. They, they tell us about two weeks before they give us the actual numbers, what the maximum statewide is going to be. Okay. Okay. We just budget 10 usually as a maximum because typically we haven't gone over 10. Um, we, we dropped down to nine, just looking at the current trends, I felt comfortable easing that down 1% in our budget process. So, you know, we've looked at our uh, loss ratios and it's just hard to tell. Sometimes our loss ratios can be re look really positive and you have a higher than expected increase. Our, our loss ratios look more favorable than they have some years. So, you know, knock on wood, hopefully you know, we'll be pleasantly surprised, but it's just hard to predict. I usually feel pretty good with Lynn's estimates on the, on those areas where, where she's making those kind of guesses. Um, they usually works out for us pretty well. So um, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. We like the, the late bonus of being able to reduce the insurance rate down if possible. And, you know, some years we've been right up almost at nine. Uh, since I've been here, we were at maybe just just under nine one year um, in the last couple of years. Last year was a bet, much better year. So it's just hard to know. So typically we, um, you know, I've heard a couple of things tonight. I've heard Mark ask for some more details around the high school class size data. Um, and I've heard you asked for some more information about JMG. Um, but I guess I would ask, is there any other information that would be helpful to bring back to just help extend our thinking about any of the items that we've mentioned here tonight? I think there's a lot more information, but I, I don't think any of it's readily available. I mean, right, we'd love to know um, high school tuition. We have to wait on that. We'd love to know what kindergarten's going to look like. We have to wait e probably even longer on that. Um, and who knows, we may, I mean, that often changes a lot, even once we get into the summer. So, I mean, those are the two areas along with, you know, as Jake pointed out, insurance. And there's a lot of things that would be helpful for us, finalized ED 279. But I, I, I think Brian is right on that, that this year it, it might have a little bit more likelihood of change than it did last year, just because of the budget uncertainty. Um, you know, the governor just gave her budget address tonight, but then also you've got, as Brian also alluded to, you've got, you know, a relatively significant amount of state and local money is in the current federal house COVID package. Sounds like that's going to stay in the Senate. And then what's going to happen with that if it passes. So I think there's a lot of stuff we'd like to have, but I don't know that we can get any of it anytime soon, unfortunately. It's just too early at this point. Yeah, I feel like a lot of years we know we have to make some cuts even if things turn out well, but it's not obvious to me that we have to make cuts if things turn out well at this point. So I think a lot of it's going to be, um, you know, we may spend less time talking about the budget this year than we have some years. I think it's mostly, I, I think we kind of get the information and we have some conversations, but a large degree, we just sit pat until getting towards the end of March when some of these numbers start to come in. No, I would agree. And I think the other thing too, maybe, maybe not information to gather, but maybe things for you and, and Reg and the, the the faculty in these departments to think about is if things go really well, you know, Brian kind of alluded to if, if the money kind of fell into our lap, you know, the possibility of this joint accredited position, in English and social studies at the high school, I'd, I'd be, you know, interested to hear more on, you know, what 
how likely you think that it would be to get quality applicants for that, or if it would be better to get split it in those, you know, you said two halftime positions. I think thinking about that would be um, useful, particularly given, you know, the fact that you said you had to cut back significantly in the electives offered in the social studies department. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to hear more on that if things work to our advantage budget wise. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you're right that there's not a lot that we can bring back at this point. Um, and we're probably going to have much shorter discussions the next couple of meetings around budget than maybe we would typically have. And then we'll pick back up toward the end of March when we have hopefully um, more information because, I mean, to stay on track with our June referendum, we have to, you know, I don't have that out in front of me, but I can look at it. I think I... I don't have my um, schedule here, but um, you know we have to lock in our budget by late April. So um, sometimes we get to the second of May, but it's it's really right at that transition. Yeah, I think I think we you tell us kind of the final thing the late April, and then we bring things back for you to yeah. kind of officially vote on. And then we sign. So it feels like late April is is kind of the end of it, of decision making. But I guess we can make final final changes. But um, it's going to be pretty compressed in the month of April. Some decision making. So you know, if we can bring you some of the items you're you're wanting to know more about through the month of March, I think it'll help just continue to to see thinking to be ready to make decisions quickly when we have these other pieces that um, we hope will come by by April. Okay. All right. Anything else on that? Anybody else want to weigh in on budget before we move on? I just want to thank everybody for the work that obviously went into this, right? I mean, this is a lot of work just to get to this point. Um, and, you know, it's spread out among administrators and, and Lynn and, you know, department heads and, and faculty and staff. So I, I I want to just kind of thank everybody for the work they put in on this to this point, even though knowing that there's much more to come, this gives us a really good starting point, I think. Um, and I can remember back earlier times where we did not have this kind of a starting point in um, late February, early March, and that was not good. So um, thanks to everyone who worked on this. Yep. And I also just echoing what Mark said, but I really feel like we've homed in on a productive process of the right level for the board to have a conversation. And, you know, the documents that came out tonight were just perfect. I think they were exactly the right things for a public discussion. So that's very helpful. All right, we uh, postponed the board self-evaluation um, till next meeting. Uh, I forget the date, first week of March, first Tuesday in March. Um, I don't think we have any co-curriculars or did I miss those in the folder? We do not. Okay, and so we're on to policies. Um, so the first policy is EEBA, which is school owned vehicles. Now that we own two vehicles, it was time to get a policy on. So this was discussed at the last policy uh, subcommittee meeting uh, in beginning of February. Uh, and Brent, as the facilities and transportation director, was there as part of those conversations. I think people felt pretty comfortable with what was presented. So I would make a motion to recognize a first read on policy EEBA as presented. Is there a second? I second. Okay, any questions or discussions? So is this all like approved by our insurance and things like that? I'm guessing. I think we had one question we were going to check against insurance that we'll um, talk through at the next policy committee meeting before we uh, bring it for a final vote. But for the most part, yes, it is based on insurance recommendations. And by, em by employee, I assume that includes stipend positions. Yes, they're yes. employees. Yeah. Any thoughts or conversation around um, clean licenses? <laughs> I, I don't know how deep you go or how hard, but, or yeah, how deep, I guess. But, you know, is there is there a check where, you know, it's not somebody who has 
three speeding tickets in the last year or something like that? Is it any discussion? Well, we're not running a um, state computer check like we do for, um, um, you know, fingerprinting and, and child safety, but uh, we do have the employee has to fill out a form stating that they don't have to do an SR-22, which is in the state of Maine, that's kind of an indication that your license is under a cloud. So it's self-reported, but that's the okay. standard. Uh, Brent, as you know, gotcha. was a policeman. He said that's a pretty good anchor point to set as a standard. So the, um, the SR-22 doesn't have anything to do with your driving record. If you are, um, if you have an SR-22 filing, it means that you've been caught not carrying auto insurance before. That's all that it Oh, means. okay. It has nothing to do with your driving. Okay, so, <clears throat> but yeah, so I, uh, then maybe the answer is that there's not, um, other than having a valid license, there's not a check that we're doing. But we, we did talk about this though a little bit and, and I can't remember what the, what the resolution was, but we did talk about this, about kind of level of infractions or, didn't we? Yeah, we went around on what kind of, we went around whether it has to be a main license or a, a US license and uh, what levels of infractions. We certainly reserve the right if an employee does something on our time that we're not happy about to cut them off regardless of what they have. Um, but, and we put a requirement for two years, but um, so we're not gonna have, you know, first year drivers. But uh, I think in the end, I mean, I'm happy to take that feedback from the board and research it more, but in the end, we did not put um, two speeding tickets disqualifies you or anything of that nature. And I don't know, I don't know if we can legally run that kind of a check or not. Well, that was my question. We would have to have a um, DMV account to do it. <clears throat> so unless we had a DMV account, it's just self-report and we're relying on what the person's telling us. Yeah, interestingly, this isn't um, a common policy in the state of Maine. We had to really go outside of the state to find sample policies to use to develop this. So there's not a lot of um, work on this in our state. And uh, I think we felt like the SR-22 was getting at what we hoped. It sounds like it's not. So um, we're going to have to look at what else we can do there. But I don't know if there's services we can pay to do it outside of the DMV that pulls on that database can you do you know if such a thing exists not that i'm aware of i i do know like um you know like insurance companies like we have a dmv account so we can run that kind of stuff so i'm sure there's companies that do it for profit out there you know that you can have a have a driving what record run yeah what our insurance, insurance company do? would there's motivation for them too i would think yeah, I don't know. We'll have to ask. Yeah, I think we that's the one area we need to distill finally finally check with insurance in any case. So we can ask them that. Would would that also be something that police departments would be able to run or they don't have those accounts? No, they have them. They yep. have them. Yep. Yeah. I think I it's worth some further some further discussion and thought. No, I think you're on the right track because when you go to take out an auto policy, they run it. So I think Brian, we should take that up again. So maybe maybe the second read won't be as quickly as we thought. Yeah, we'll see. Um, I'm trying to remember how the calendar works. Is the board meeting before or after our next policy it's, meeting? It's after our next policy meeting. Okay, well, we may get it resolved at the next policy meeting. And if not, we'll wait to get that resolved. Any other uh, feedback on this policy? Like Meredith said, this is really a hodgepodge from five, six policies from other states, um, but they mostly seem pretty common sense. Does, does Hamden not have one? It's, I think they have staff driving vans and stuff, I've heard. Do they not have anything? I did not come across this policy for Hamden. Uh. Uh, a lot of people, they only have the policies that Drummond Woodson gives to them which um, does not include this policy. Yeah, I, I don't see anything for Hamden on EEBA, so. All right, seeing no other discussion, we'll go ahead and take a vote to recognize a first read. No, and of course it has to come back for a second read. 
Um, so we'll vote. Aaron? Aye. Jake? Aye. All right, I'll get this right, Leo. Aye. Mark? Aye. And I also vote aye. So next up, we've got, uh, these are revisions. EFA is a fairly small revision to our food service procurement. Uh, so it does not require two reads, just a revision. Um, this was basically, you may remember we needed this policy because of our um, audit by the uh, USDA and um, they came back to us and told us we were missing a section, which you see down at the bottom, which is to place in the policy how a uh, person can file a complaint of discrimination. So it's required by the USDA. It certainly seems like a good idea and innocuous. So the policy committee recommended this forward as a revision. So I would make a motion to revise policy EFA uh, as, amend, as the, uh, amended as presented. Is there a second? I second. Any further discussion or comments? The change is down at the bottom if you're looking at it. I'm not sure this was a change, but I, I did, I was curious how much uh, on the RFP, I think it was an RFP um, criteria, the order struck me a little interesting that it's it, price, service, delivery, and quality was last. Just uh, struck me as a little bit funny. <laughs> that's the U.S. government at work for you, Leo. Jeez. <laughs> oh, I don't believe that's <laughs> optional for us. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> only food. Yeah. <laughs> right. We're only putting it in our kids' bodies. Yes. <laughs> I, I, um, yeah, I don't, this is all copied out of boilerplate from the USDA, so I don't think we have a choice about that. Any other questions or comments? All right, we'll go ahead and take a vote to uh, revise this policy as amended. Aaron? Aye. Jake? Aye. Leo? Aye. Mark? Aye. I also vote aye. And the last policy we have coming up is EEBB, which is use of private vehicles. And we figured as long as we were looking at EEBA, we should look at this one. And uh, we have really just a small couple of small touch-ups that we made, uh, but we did feel like we should bring those forward. So I would make a motion to approve the revision to policy EE. BB uh, amended as presented. Is there a second? I second. Any discussion? Can I, can I ask why the why the change? The first one about superintendent or designee. Yeah. In most cases, that's the building principal. But yeah, um, you can imagine a case where the building principal was out that day or something, and it didn't leave a lot of flexibility. This is the way most of our policies are written. All right. It's not anticipated that it goes to the superintendent all the time. Gotcha. And Richard had mentioned, I think in particular, a couple of instances that he's had in his career where he needed to be able to authorize that and the superintendent was unavailable. So I think, I, if correct me if I'm wrong, but I do see Richard nodding. I think that's was where that came from. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. Yep. Well, I, mean, well this, it, I guess I was reading this a little bit differently that this was now kind of making it that the superintendent does have to either designate, either make the call or designate, but that's so not the, the designation can be in advance. Okay. And in general, uh, almost standing, anywhere it says, says super, order, exactly. Anywhere it says superintendent or designee, the building principals are already designees and other gotcha. people like, you know, Lisa or somebody else may be a designee as well. So, so this just adds superintendent can also, if the, if the principal's not there. Yeah, and it lets so. it be somebody who's not the principal, right? It could be Sam Runco or it could be Lisa who's not a building principal. Yeah. Got yeah. It. Seemed like it was more restricting, but technically it's less restricting. That was the intention. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Anything else? All right, we'll go ahead and vote. Aaron? Aye. Jake? Aye. Leo? Aye. Mark? Aye. I also vote aye. So those two policies are now on the books and we'll bring EEBA back. Subcommittee reports. Um, 
you've seen the main output of our February subcommittee meeting. Uh, we did start back on DJ. We decided that it would be nice to make a table to uh, summarize that, which I've got to present at the policy subcommittee next uh, next month. Uh, other than that, we um, knock on wood have a clear slate. We're trying to get back to moving through the policies. So we're gonna start attacking. Uh, we have a by policy on our, our policy on policies. We have to review our policies every three years. So that's what we're doing. We've moved through A through D and um, we're now gonna start the E policies um, next meeting. That's what's up at policy subcommittee. Anything from UTC? Uh, no, UTC and wellness haven't met. Okay. And Spruce? There is no uh, future meeting date set, but rumor to be late in the spring. Okay. Curriculum subcommittee, I think. Yeah. Um, you want to give that, Meredith? Since I, since I um, forgot to go last time. <laughs> No worries. Uh, our discussions in curriculum committee this month focused on um, reconsideration of our um, math credit uh, for Algebra 1B and the designation of that from a two credit math course to a one credit math and one credit elective course. Um, and we also talked about um, the transition of a push from a two year course to a one-year course in the creation of honor civics for 10th grade. And, and I know Shauna's on the call, so I'll, it'll save myself an email. I did uh, review the material you sent me, Shauna. And so whenever you want to talk on that, I'd be happy to do that. I think there was also some revision discussed of IKF, right? To update IKF relative to kind of the graduation cohorts and where we are right now. Yeah, and that came out of the um, uh, math, clarifying the math. So yeah, I forgot to mention, we're gonna have, I just added that to the draft agenda for policy, but that'll be at the policy committee meeting uh, in March as well. Okay. Um, facilities building committee. Um, yeah, we had our bi-monthly meeting with uh, the contractors and the architects and um, everything, you know, mostly things are going well. We've had um, colossal trouble with the power coming into the buildings, which is Versant. You may have noticed Versant is not a customer centered organization and that applies to schools trying to do major new construction. Um, so we're, we're kind of struggling through trying to get approval for them on the uh, outside of the building connections. And that's that's been a pain and a lot of, you know, it's not breaking the budget, but it was it's some of our biggest changes in cost to date, but that's outside of our contractors control. It's really nobody's fault but Versants. Um, otherwise, you know, you, uh, Meredith mentioned that um, some of the hallways in ASA uh, had been narrowed down to small areas to give room for construction and those are opened up again. Um, and up at the high school, you may have noticed that they've started to roof over the auditorium. So that, that's a big deal once they can start to close that off and uh, work through the winter inside. We've been lucky, I think, with the weather. They also over break removed the windows from the cafeteria on the directionally is at the north side that face the the new hallway that's being constructed um, in the addition there. So it's bricked over and unfortunately we can't see out to see their progress now. Uh, but similarly, they went all the way down that bank of windows that ran all along the back of the band room that's now the kitchen. That was all also filled in over break. So, um, you know, lots of progress to get that to a point where they can, um, you know, make make big changes uh, in those areas in the coming months. The, um, the pictures that we saw today of uh, the progress that they've made is, you know, just remarkable in, in just a few weeks, the, the progress that we're seeing. So um, Bowman's really working hard to stay on schedule. I think, as Brian said, Versen is the only thing that's being brought up by them as an area of concern. And that's just because it, it feels out of their control. They're having to wait on Versant to respond. Uh, but 
interestingly, just this afternoon, Brent got a call from Versant to initiate um, the the process that they need us to work with them on um, with being able to basically with the installation of a new pole behind ASA, uh, there's some work that has to be done with a, um, um, you know, granting them the uh, uh, easement to that land. So that's a process we have to go through. You may have noticed that they poured uh, a little area right to the front right of the middle school. Uh, we were hoping that was going to be a little less uh, noticeable, but because of existing conditions that were found underneath that had to go there, we plan on doing some landscaping around that uh, cement structure where the transformer is going to be to help um, hide that, you know, large structure that had to be put there. So um, that that also appeared over February vacation. We knew it was going to be done then, but it was just made it real where it is to, to see it in place after the vacation. Um, similarly, on the same topic, um, the architects uh, been asking us to engage with some decisions around what we're going to put on some of our buildings that were uh, that are part of this project, and there are two in particular that, that they're asking us about. One is on the Asa Adams canopy. So what will what will we put there in terms of a, you know. Um, a signage, signage and, and lettering for the for the school and then similarly on the auditorium. Um, Asa Adams is mostly straightforward um, because it is the Asa Adams school. Uh, the, the one piece of kind of consideration with that is do we insert the word elementary to provide some context, especially from people who are from away who are maybe trying to find the elementary school or new to the area. Uh, and help differentiate it for people visiting our school and community from elsewhere. So that's, and the canopy was, is really large enough to accommodate that and it fills it nicely. So that's the, the one consideration there. But the main thing we wanted to talk tonight about is a little bit about auditorium name because it, it's, um, there are lots of choices there. And um, we, through the process, started with calling the space, uh, Performing Arts Center and then changed to more of, I think, a, a utilitarian uh, name of auditorium, kind of trying to reflect the many uses that we saw for that space. Um, and now as we look to, you know, what are the letters going to say on outside of it, um, we wanted to engage the board in just some initial discussion about that. I think, you know, ideally if we had, um, you know, uh, either someone who have, has distinguished themselves themselves in the arts who was a member of the Orono community at some point in the past, you know, that we wanted to honor in that way. That's one uh, way that people consider naming something other than, you know, the RSU 26 Orono Community Auditorium or Performing Arts Center. You would consider naming it after a person um, in that way or someone who was a benefactor for the space who, you know, gave a uh, considerable contribution to help fund uh, you know, a significant portion of the project. Um, we certainly don't have that other than the Orono community has funded, you know, the, the building of that space. And so we just wanted to bring that before this group to begin talking about it, about what we might call that space. I think, um, you know, it's something that uh, certainly not a permanent decision about the letters we put on a building can certainly be changed. But um, it does cost something now for whatever we put up. So we want to try to get it right for now. And uh, it could certainly be changed in the future if something um, else was determined or emerged around that. Brian, Mark, you guys have been in the building committee where we kind of started talking about this. Do you have anything to add to that? I mean, my thoughts are there's for, for the auditorium, there's personally, I kind of, on the auditorium, there, I think there's four choices, right? We find a donor. But I wouldn't want to give it away cheap, right? If somebody gave us half a million dollars, we could put that at an endowment and take 25000 a year to keep operating expenses for equipment. That I, I would certainly be open to that, but I, I don't anticipate that kind of a donor. We, we have not built. That doesn't just drop out of a tree. You have to have had an ongoing fundraising machinery, and we haven't done that. We've talked about it, but we don't have, honestly, that many alums to tap that are that rich. Um, but, but that's an option. We could name it after an illustrious alum, uh, 
you know, probably especially in the performing arts. Not a whole lot of um, ones that I know, but, you know, I haven't lived in Orono for a long time. Nicole Maines does come forward. She's on TV, at least these days. Um, you can name it after somebody, illustrious community member, um, either in the performing arts, maybe an underrepresented minority. So you can, or you could just, um, you know, the Orono community paid for it. This is a point of pride, hopefully, for the Orono community going forward. You could just call it Orono. Um, and then auditorium or performing arts center. I think we did switch to auditorium for reasons to make it clear that it's not just for performances, but for classroom usage and a lot of other usages. But I kind of, I, I, as a name on the building outside, I kind of like performing arts center. So I'm very open to any of those four choices, depending on what comes forward. But if I were to vote today, it's not a strong opinion. I'd probably just vote for Orono Performing Arts Center, but that's that's just my thought. I, we really wanted to get input from everybody and for that matter, let the community know this is being debated if people have great ideas or strong opinions too. Yeah, I mean, my, my preference would be for the donor to fall out of the sky, but I'm also uh, not uh, thinking that's going to happen. Um, I do agree with Brian. I would not want to um, give naming your rights away for um, it'd have to be a significant contribution to consider that. And then you'd also have to consider where it was coming from. I just, I don't think it's just a dollar sign. It's also where it would be coming from, but um, given the likelihood that that's not going to happen, I think my preference goes along with Brian, but maybe with maybe one tweak, I think I would put, um, I'd say Orono Community Performing Arts Center would probably be my preference. Um, I, I, I do understand the, the reason why we shifted away from performing arts to auditorium at one point. That being said, um, I, I tend to like on the sign outside the building, I like performing arts better than auditorium. And, and just because we call it the Performing Arts Center doesn't mean that it has to be limited in its usage to so-called quote unquote performing arts. I think we can still use it. Um, however, we need to and, and the community needs to. So my, my preference right now, short of that mysterious donor appearing would be Orono Community Performing Arts Center. I agree with Mark, uh, assuming a donor doesn't come forward. Um, I think a good tie is to the community because this is something the community's <clears throat> supported the thought of for a while. And, and um, you know, obviously this was a big part of the, the bond and the community supported that. So I, you know, feel strong that, you know, it should be involved uh, in the name somehow. So, you know, I do like Orno Community Performing Arts Center. Pack for short. <laughs> I do like performing arts better than auditorium. I think it sounds a little more highbrow, uh, <laughs> but uh, and I like <clears throat> I like uh, the community in there, and I like the idea of going out to the community to to see what's out there for better ideas. I'm not a I'm not a really great creative guy either, so. Um, and and also potentially if if um, people are interested or able to uh, start putting feelers out, let 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 it be known there's a potential opportunity here. And it's I like the I like your thought of you know half a million Brian and an endowment that you know what does whatever you know continues some kind of upkeep or or something to that effect. I that's it that's ideal, um, and you never know. I can't think off the top of my head someone that's going to write that check either, but you really just never know either. I mean, it's it's done and it's there, so it's at this point just the naming. It's not of it's not if you give us this, we're going to build it. So, um, it all all good ideas. Yeah, I would I'd actually be interested to see what happens between now and the next board meeting of you know public input on what people say after after we sort of thrown this out there because I, I didn't really realize that it was coming up with the naming so I don't want to like throw I mean all your ideas were great but I, I'm kind of interested to see what happens for the next couple of years. Yep. I do like adding the word community too by the way so I mean that's all we wanted to do tonight is to kind of get some initial feedback and to kind of put that question out in the community a bit and let that gestate for uh, probably the center, you know, we're looking sometime 
next winter. I don't want to put a specific date on it, but um, about a year from now. So um, we need to get there, but we wanted to leave space for a real process. It's not super urgent either, however. Um, okay. Next up, any requests for other business? Any requests for future agenda items? We're open to public comment. I did have, it probably goes under the next one, but I had an email from uh, Cami to, to update us on core enrollment because it has changed since I last got that um, update. So just to correct that, uh, core is actually at 25 now and they have a couple of uh, people interested in visiting and, and learning more and we'll have to assess, you know, capacity uh, to accept um, where, where our ceiling is with those. So 25 is the current actual enrollment. And it's physical space that's the limiting factor. Yes. I didn't see any public comment come forthcoming, but just give that one last chance. Okay. Um, our next meeting is March 9th, uh, Tuesday, March 9th at 6 p.m. by Zoom. Is there any request from the board for information or follow-up? I was um, interested in information about um, mask breaks and I know they're happening. I just don't know to what frequency. I think I have a pretty good idea to what frequency at the high school, um, but I'm not sure about um, the middle school or ASA. And you know, if you know the answer now, you're welcome to give it or if not, find out. Yeah, I, it, I would say it's just uh, at teacher discretion, how that's handled at all levels. I think there's some natural opportunities for mass breaks. Um, particularly at ASA when they're more self-contained, when they, you know, are eating, for example, or having snack time. But beyond that, I, I don't, I'd have to have each principal kind of give their observation of that because it's not regimented. It's not like we've established that, you know, we do it at this point of the day, every day. I, I can speak to the, to the middle school. We have a, like a sort of an informal uh, snack break in the morning that, uh, I'd say it's pretty universal uh, participation uh, where students can have a short snack. I think it's right at the end of period three in the morning. And, uh, you know, so they can, they can take their masks off and have a snack while seated in the classroom. And, uh, and then of course, lunchtime, uh, uh, you know, students get the opportunity to take off their masks while they're eating lunch in the gym. And that's another time during the day. And then, uh, more informally, I would say, you know, as needed based on individual uh, situations, you know, where students can like leave their room and take off their masks, that sort of thing. I would echo what Richard and Meredith both said as well. It's definitely more um, in the classroom, you know, it is in their individual classrooms um, and it's more at teacher discretion. Um, and if they're outside at recess and they need a mask break, I know specifically for my first graders, um, they know to step away and um, they know that if they are taking their mask off, they step way away from the others. And is, is water, our water bottles still not an allowed option? I know that I, at ASA, they, they are allowed, and I think at the middle school, they're allowed, and it's teacher discretion. Um, Reg? Yeah, so we haven't, um, we haven't got to change that policy, but I, I would say our mask breaks are a little more frequent. Like teachers are typically taking them outside each block, and so that's when um, students bring their water bottle with them, and they go outside, and uh, take a break so uh, but we haven't changed anything kind of on the inside 
as far as food and drink in the classroom. And there's there, something that may that could be that will be considered or yeah, that's what I mean. It hasn't really been raised to me as an issue for the last couple months. I mean, it was something that people were talking about in the fall as we were getting kind of back into this, you know, into the swing of things. But um, I believe that people are finding, you know, wines, it works out to about once an hour to, you know, go outside and bring their water bottle if they want to. That seems to be working pretty well. But um, I'm taking the no news, good news approach. It hasn't really been raised as an issue, but happy to talk about it. And I don't recall in the student survey that that was really listed yeah. as a area of concern. Yeah, I don't think it was mentioned at all out of 140 responses. So, you yeah, know, my impression at the high school is that they're happening pretty frequent, if not, you know, like uh, Reg said, every single block. Yeah. Any other requests for information? All right, at this point, we have an executive session. We are not gonna take any votes after executive session except a vote to adjourn. So you're welcome to sit in the waiting room if you want, but it's probably not worth your time. That's up to you though. Um, I would make a motion to go under executive session under one MRSA 40560 labor negotiations. Is there a second? I second. Any discussion? We'll go ahead and vote. Aaron? Aye. Jake? Aye. Leo? Aye. Mark? Aye. I also vote aye.